Hello, hello. Welcome back. Hope you guys are feeling energized. You enjoyed your morning activities. You're feeling well fed, well watered. Um, we have a really exciting program for the second half of our day. Um, I know that I got to kind of wander around and look at all the cool stuff that was happening. The workshops looked amazing. I'm sad I didn't get to make a kite, um, but maybe you guys can show me yours. Anyway, I hope that you also um, picked up your bags. I know you're like, will she stop talking about the bags? But the bags are so cool, so please pick yours up. Um, at the registration, it has the reader. If you guys stayed for the writing workshop, there's some really great writing from the panelists there. Um, Bryn and I wrote the intro. It's really, it's really fabulous, so check it out. Again, going to do the, the social media plug, Span17 at Google Design. If for some reason you haven't been on the internet, which I really doubt, um, that's how you get on. And yeah, so, to, so the, the lineup for this afternoon, we're going to have four talks, one moderated discussion and a panel. Um, as always, you can, you can consult the schedule, g.co slash span17. And to kick things off, I'm ready to introduce our first speaker. Sarah Hendren is an artist, design researcher, and professor based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her work centers on adaptive and assistive technologies, prosthetics, inclusive design, and accessible architecture. Please join me in welcoming Sarah to the stage. Hi there. It's good to be here. Thanks for including me. Um, thanks especially to Barbara and to Bryn. Uh, for including me. So I am an artist who works at an engineering school. No one is more surprised than me to find that out still four years later. Um, you may or may not know of Olin. It's tiny. We have 350 students total, and there are no departments, and we're only about 12 years old. All our students get engineering degrees, uh, but it's a very unconventional, hands-on kind of place. I can tell you more about it if you're interested. Um, and today I want to talk about some lessons from the design studio. I want to talk about actually doubt and belief, actually, in the context of the design studio. And this is what it looks like for me and my students, and I think probably has some similarities to what you're doing. That is, trying to get ideas out into the world. I think that doubt and belief um, are pretty critical and urgent matters for us as designers and also as people right now, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So I do um, teach human-centered design and also design and disability at Olin. Um, I've been pleased to see that there's a thread here at SPAN um, thinking about adaptive, um, adaptive life, inclusive life, and the condition of disability. Um, so we work on prosthetics and assistive technology. Some of them are um, recognizable as engineering, and, but many of them are not. So it's, my lab is called the Adaptation and Ability Group. It's a social and technical lab, uh, sort of creative lab for technology and the body. Probably not the prosthetics that you might expect. So let me just tell you a couple of stories. This is Carmen Papalia. Uh, he's an artist. Um, who lost his vision in his early 20s, so he's blind now, he uses a cane to get around. And Carmen would say, Carmen uses a smartphone and all kinds of high-tech technologies and uses the white cane, but Carmen would say that the cane actually brings him all kinds of help that he doesn't need in public, you know, people falling all over themselves trying to help him and that the cane doesn't bring him the help that he does need. So he makes artworks that are about this conundrum that he finds himself in, this vexed relationship with technology. So he makes hilarious spectacles like this in public, like a cane so big you could never get around it or ignore it if you tried, or this where he worked with a brass band um, to uh, co-create navigational cues for getting around the city of Berkeley, California. So, so for turns and stops and starts, there were these big musical gestures being made by this band to make just an enormous um, uh, spectacle of getting around. Or this incredibly beautiful um, short film that Carmen made which, in which he's got a megaphone and no cane and no assistance and is walking around the streets of Vancouver loudly asking for help, repeatedly 
over and over. Can you help me? Can you help me? It's a really, the pathos and the transparency of this are incredibly beautiful. So I teach a class called Investigating Normal, and Carmen came to um, class to work on a kind of design project together in this same vein. So when Carmen came, we participated, first of all, in this long-running um, collaborative work of Carmen's called Blind Field Shuttle. So Carmen is leading this group all over campus. He led us around for about an hour, <clears throat> and we were all behind him with our eyes closed and with one hand on the shoulder of the person in front of us. And this is not, not at all a simulation of the experience of blindness. It's nothing more and nothing less than a kind of condition of interdependence and an altered sensory experience of the world. And that was um, part of a whole set of events that went on when Carmen with, was with us. And then what he asked um, a team of students to do was to make um, what he calls an acoustic mobility device. What could this be? What would an acoustic mobility device look like? Something that's supposed to be for vision, but actually could be animated with sound. So we did what you do when you're in this situation, and there's all kinds of possibilities. We made what are called in engineering sketch models, right? And these are just patch jobs. This is going to be familiar to you, right? Like, oh, okay, a smartphone and a wooden dowel and a tennis ball, and like you're squinting at it. You're trying to, you know, figure out what's possible. Um, and we, you know, did a contact mic at the end of a cane and then hooked it up with an amp, and that turned out to be more or less the right idea. Eventually, the students came up with this, this kind of DIY homemade boombox with a contact mic, actually 3D printed in the end of the cane. And it's for playing the built environment. It's for uh, literally scraping along and taking the kind of temperature and the texture of, um, of what's in the built environment. So that's an interesting project, still kind of ongoing. I want to, however, back up the tape on this project to this moment right here, this sketch modeling moment. Um, and here's Carmen, very gamely, allowing himself to be sketch modeled up with these pipe cleaners. And they're modeling out, you know, some kind of, maybe these are sensors, or maybe that's creating this spiky field around Carmen. I'm not sure, because it was, you know, there were many ideas trying to get born. But this moment, I mean, this is when the thing, things are happening, right? This takes a, an enormous amount of faith using childlike, humble materials, again, to try to squint and see, literally and figuratively, what can happen. Now, there are all kinds of questions in the room, happening in the room at a moment like this. Is this thing going to be remotely, technically feasible, what you've got on order here, in any universe, much less in a semester? And doesn't, isn't this just sort of silly games? Like, doesn't, you know, Carmen actually want a really, a better cane? I mean, what are we actually doing here? Is this engineering at all? And how is he going to use it? And don't I have a better idea over here on the other side of the room? And by the way, what is all this about blindness and disability politics? There's tremendous uncertainty happening among and with these people in the room. Now, all those hard questions that I just named, those call for doubt, for analysis and doubt. But this moment right here calls for belief, powerful belief. So let me just define uh, doubting and belief in terms of this man, Peter Elbow, who wrote a book called Writing Without Teachers in 1973. And he wrote an essay at the, at the, as an appendix at the end of this book called The Doubting Game and The Believing Game. And what started as an appendix uh, became the kind of the subject of, of Peter Elbow's career. He's a retired writing professor from um, Univers University of Massachusetts at Amherst, taught writing seminars for decades and decades, and ended up writing seven or eight essays revisiting this idea of the doubting game and the believing game. Why? Well, in teaching writing, uh, Elbow found himself saying over and over and over, what you've got to do, young writer, you have to be willing to do free writing, unedited creation, right? You've got to silence that inner critic. You have to be willing to put more and more and more out into the world. And he would even declare certain sessions of his seminars with students as times for what he said, no arguing. No arguing right now, right? We're so tempted to debate each other's work, but no arguing, just listening. And as you can imagine, Elbow was criticized for this. He took a lot of heat from his counterparts who said, 
gosh, this guy has no rigor at all. Like, where's the skepticism? He's just coddling these young students and telling them everything they make is brilliant. And what is this? And so, so he got sick of this accusation and he said, no, no, I think there's something else going on here. And I think what it is, is the doubting game and the believing game. He says, the doubting game represents the kind of thinking most widely honored and taught in our culture. It's sometimes called critical thinking. It's the disciplined practice of trying to be as skeptical and analytical as possible with every encounter. By trying hard to doubt ideas, we can discover hidden contradictions, bad reasoning, or other weaknesses in them, especially in the case of ideas that seem true or attractive. We're using doubting as a tool to scrutinize and test, and this is a good thing, and he's affirming the use of doubting for sure. However, in contrast, the believing game is the disciplined practice of trying to be as welcoming and accepting as possible to every idea we encounter in that sketch modeling moment, for instance. Not just listening to views different from our own and holding back from arguing with them, not just trying to restate them without bias, but actually trying to believe them. We're using believing as a tool to scrutinize and test in the same way we did in the doubting game. It wasn't just the dreamers and the possibilitarians and the realists over here, that each is a tool. Instead of scrutinizing widely accepted or fashionable ideas for hidden flaws, the believing game asks us to scrutinize unfashionable and even repellent ideas for hidden virtues. Often we cannot see what's good in someone else's idea or our own till we work at believing it. Methodological believing is what he came to call this. And he would say that these are games. That is, they have starts and finishes. They are things that you try on temporarily. They are roles that you play and that you need both of them. Again, not yin-yang style, not like ones about emotions and ones about your uh, critical mind, but that rationality includes all of these things. So when we're in a moment like this, or this, we're doing sketch modeling, we are playing the believing game. And what, is that, what does a believing game then look like in the design studio, connected to writing, but a little bit different? So again, sketch modeling, what is it? No more and no less than nurturing a belief in the not yet. Um, I, I never get tired of, kind of, of those images of an idea that is like a little fledgling bird trying to get born, and we should recognize it for what it is. That belief in the not yet and in the becoming, it's a kind of ethics in design that we, um, I think we take for granted, but that is the believing game. And how, how do we nurture the not yet? I talk a lot to my students about commitment on the one hand and provisionality on the other. That you, you know if you're making apps or services or hardware or software, you have to commit fully to making that thing walk and talk and look like something that could go out into the world and then the next day you have to hold it in the provisional and be willing to do all kinds of surgery and rip it apart and be completely starting over again, right? But you can't, you can't dither in provisionality. What if, on the one hand, on the other hand, you can't do anything unless you commit fully to that idea, that nurtured, not yet, that sketch model, and then your willingness to hold it so lightly and provisionally that you can flexibly, resiliently go back and forth and back and forth. It's like hopping a fence. I am married to a, uh, a documentary editor and producer, and after our kids are asleep, we often talk about this kind of stuff. And he says that documentary producing, writing stories, for him often two-hour complex documentaries, is like laying tracks. So you have where you are, and you're trying to take your audience where you want to be, way over here. And lots of times, it's counterintuitive and surprising, and you've got to work to get your audience to come with you. And you're laying that track. Well, but, but no one talks about enough how difficult the commitment and the provisionality is at laying each of those tracks, that you're, you're laying something down, yes, maybe this could go to air tomorrow, maybe this could go out tomorrow, but no, now we're going to dial back from it again, and we're going to try it again, and again, and again. But the believing game, the commitment part, the silencing the critic, that's much harder than, the, um, than finding what's wrong. So commitment and provisionality. Um, secondly, I would say at a moment like this, where we're letting stuff we can sense be in the room, that we're taking difficult subject matter, in my case, the politics of disability, which is delicate, and we are letting our objects hold a kind of faith for us. We are believing that that thing 
can start to get at what is it that Carmen is trying to do to negotiate an accessible and inclusive world? And can this playful thing start to get at it? Can I, a young engineer with no experience of blindness, can I let that object speak to me past my rational mind and can it, can it do something? Can it help me believe in the possibility of making something good together? And then thirdly, um, our believing game is about our belief in one another, after all. One encounter at a time. And I can't emphasize enough, in an encounter like this with Carmen, each micro-interaction between a person like Carmen and my young students, what that's doing in uh, building their faith in their own capacity to get over their awkwardness and to ask him questions and to figure out when to offer help and when to step back, how to speak about ability and disability. These are all tremendously difficult. But our belief in each other, playing the believing game with each other, um, is a powerful, powerful tool for getting that work done. I think maybe you're thinking of this is like design thinking, like yes and, improv style and brainstorming and whatever. But I think that there's something bigger going on here than just those kind of clever devices um, and tools. So that when we're in this situation, like in my classroom, or indeed all the many ways in which people everywhere are sketch modeling the world, that it is more than just brainstorming, that there's nurturance of the not yet. There's um, faith, a kind of faith provisionally held in objects, and that there's belief going on with one another. Elbow would say, methodological believing is a discipline, and it's decoupled from temperament or naivete or credulity. Just as you don't have to be a generally skeptical person to use methodological doubting, we don't have to be credulous or weak-minded to believe lots of things, temporarily, and to try to believe them even more. I'll just tell you about one other project, and that's this long-running project now, which is an obsession, it's called Slope Intercept, little math joke for the afternoon. Um, and it's a kind of obsession now, four years in running uh, with the incline plane, which is one of Galileo's simple machines. I'm always finding myself, like in 2017, everybody's doing digital design, and I'm going like, guys, pulleys, you know, like wheel and axle. So I, I just like cannot get over the magic of the alteration of force across a surface that happens on an incline plane. So I won't tell you um, a lengthy, I could tell you so much about these, but I, I won't tell you much about this original little set, which is modular and stacks and nests and is portable and um, got a big, beautiful piano hinge on the end. But I will just tell you that these were originally designed for two kinds of city users in the built environment that never get thought of in the same kind of space, requiring a kind of faith in the, in the objects to hold those traditions, those contradictions. One is um, skateboarders and the other is wheelchair users. These ramps meet uh, a gray area in the architectural code of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is the single step entrance that you see here. And you'll find that typology all over the place. I could tell you lots um, about that. But I like the weird Venn diagram that's happening there. But we tell a certain story about skateboarding in the built environment. We tell a very different story about wheelchair use. Could an object hold those contradictions and force them together to find um, some new resonances. So I won't also tell you about the whole weird gonzo archive of um, ramps that I built on the project uh, website. And I won't tell you much about, but I will say that the belief in these objects is what made possible some events like this, where in Toronto, with a, I ran a workshop where um, wheelchair users and a professional skateboarder and community developer, we went around kind of auditing this whole section of Toronto um, printed out photos and remapped in real time, and then um, invited an architectural theorist and this person in the middle who's from Parks and Recreation in Toronto with the skateboarder and wheelchair user activist to think about what is the future of the built environment? Might there be temporarily, if these, persons, if these people had the ear of this guy to say, what do we want to see in the built environment? Where, do, where are there overlaps in distinctions? So again, here, Sketch modeling, it's not just stuff, it's not just hardware and software, but prototyping an event and prototyping a kind of encounter provisionally to kind of see what can we, can we summon the kind of belief of, of a giant what if question, a fabricated question mark in public via the stuff we make that some difficult subject matter can be held in objects. Um, not solving it, unresolved and suspended, but nonetheless with belief there. 
that we can solve some problems, we can ask some questions, and that engineering and art can do both. But I will say that brings me to the latest iteration of this collaboration, which is with um, Alice Shepard, who's a wheelchair dancer, and she asked my lab and students to make a stage scale ramp. This was kind of her just very general brief. So Alice came to campus and she um, danced for us and the students then prototyped, and you can see my little ramps um, here in the foreground, um, a bunch of ramps to kind of see um, what, it, what the conditions that she would like for this stage and how high and how fast might she move. And, and in all this, there's so much happening, right, between the students, between and among these students. They're in a, this is in a mechanics class, not in invest investigating normal. So they're asking themselves, is this physics and does it count? Where is the physics in the world? And what is it like to use a wheelchair? And what is it that she's trying to make here? And it's not an access ramp, it's purely for expressive beauty. And what is my role then, even here as a young technical maker? Um, I wish I could enumerate for you just how, how extraordinary it is to have someone like Alice um, on campus, not just for the kind of performative, but again, for all of what that required of students in their prototyping, um, in their taking feedback, in their asking Alice difficult and awkward questions about her embodiment, how they move around her, what she told them, how she exploded myths for them about what wheelchair use is like, um, the sensory pleasure of it. They, she was surprising them by saying, you know, how beautiful and balletic it can be just to move in the built environment, to say nothing of dance. And then the students, you know, again, had to conjure their own belief that at 18, 19, they could create what ended up being um, a giant 24-foot uh, ramped stage um, this model here, um, which was really at the cusp of their capacities. And then it went on to become uh, professionally built with a stage shop um, that's now been installed in uh, New York and in the Bay Area. For Alice to do, Alice and her collaborator, Laurel Lawson, to do incredibly beautiful things with bodies and gear and essentially a mathematical function, that is the inclined plane just those relationships of gravity and resistance. So Alice is now in the process of doing residencies all over the place um, about this as architecture, as dance, as disability politics. I also got invited to go to Seoul and to install um, uh, what I'm calling a ramped platform kit, kind of an outgrowth of that um, uh, project. And Alice came with me and performed there. Um, and we had a special invitation there. I had a number of conversations with disability advocates there, and we had a special invitation to chair users there to come to the, um, to the performance and made some new connections with very young wheeled gear users in the built environment and some after hours um, fun that we witnessed too. Um, that again, this was a kind of belief in one another, um, Alice and me hashing out all of these difficult politics, um, being in Seoul like this where our, where our contexts were so powerfully different, um, but summoning always the willingness to, to hold in the provisional, but nonetheless to commit to those experiences and to let the objects hold that faith for us. You know, Elba would say, the believing game is alive, but not well in our midst. Look more closely at people who are deeply smart and creative, rather than just quick in debate. People who find new ideas and creative solutions rather than just criticizing or developing the implications of existing ideas. People who collaborate productively with others and bring about action. I think you'll see that many of these people are using the believing game. But because of our current model of what good thinking looks like, most of us lack the lens or language to see this ability, to dwell generously in ideas alien from our own. We don't see it as intellectual sophistication or careful thinking. When we see them listening or drawing out others, we call them generous or nice rather than smart. 
We don't connect to good listening to intelligence and we call creativity merely a mystery. I hardly need to say to you how deeply gendered the believing game and the willingness to play it can, can roll out in the world. Elbow says, we say, gosh, somehow a good design collaboration, somehow those people can mobilize others and actually get things done. But we see that as a social and personal gift rather than as an intellectual skill. So the believing game, let the believing game be what it is, an intellectual skill. Now, there is no talking about belief and doubt <laughs> in 2017 without addressing the precariousness of these ideas, right? And we live in a time in which it feels like our alternatives sometimes are the kind of nihilism of fake news or the science march claiming that the good thing about science is that it's true whether you believe it or not, that these are kind of posed as polarities for us. And let me assure you that I'm on the side of science, but even science in its practice is deeply complicated. That is how data gets collected and what counts as evidence, and you all know this. It's not, especially for designers, neat and clear what we do with scientific truth. So how do we live in between those things? I think the practice, the repeated practice of doubting and believing games in and among each other is critical here. So let's say, yes, that facts do establish realities with all those caveats intact, but what for you, young designer, what do you build, what's your next move, what does a repaired world look like? I mean, if only it were so simple that an affirmation of science, uh, for instance, or an affirmation of simple truth could get you there. No, you have to practice. So let this be, for all of us, I hope, um, an affirmation, a kind of, uh, a kind of daring to sketch model the future, to nurture the not yetness with the believing game, um, to let things hold our faith and our contradictions. Um, let's believe in each other, and that's, that that's a practice of our rationality and um, a commitment to veracity. I think in all design, there is a necessarily small O optimism, and I do mean small O, right? It, we don't have to be tech saviors to nonetheless believe that we are out there taking in some, the sometimes bleak state of the world, and we have to get up the next day and continue to build things. So there is a kind of, it's a constitutive property. What next? What next? And to continue to try in belief and doubt. Um, but if nothing else, um, rings true for you today, just the next time you are in this situation, this beautiful and humble little situation where something is trying to get itself born among people, I would just ask that you say not, wow, that was like really fun and cool and kind of like we just did some good design and there were good people on that team and not sure what happened. Don't say that. That was the game. That was the game. Call it what it is. Thanks. That was amazing. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm, I'm a believer, 100%. Okay. Our next panelists are interested in exploring the next wave of experiences in art, design, and technology. Heather Kelly is an award-winning game designer, media artist, curator, and a professor. She is a founding member of the experimental game collective Kokorimori. Golan Levin is an artist, engineer, and professor of computation arts at CMU. He also is the director of the Frank Ratchi Studio for Creative Inquiry, a laboratory for atypical and antidisciplinary research across the arts, science, technology, and culture. Our moderator, is Kenrick McDowell, and he's worked at the interse intersection of culture and technology for companies like RGA and Focus Features, and he currently leads the Artists and Machine Intelligence Program at Google. Please join, Kenrick, uh, please join me in welcoming Kenrick and the panelists to the stage. Hi, thank you, Amber. So we um, each have some slides that we're going to present here in the beginning, and then we'll get into a, a conversation together. Um, I, will, I will begin. 
<laughs> so uh, as Amber said, my name is Kenrick. I lead the Artists and Machine Intelligence Group. We're, where do I, oh, there we go. We are based in um, Google Research. You may have heard about something called Deep Dream, possibly um, by the manifestation of this image here that we call colloquially trippy squirrel.jpg. Oh, sorry, next slide. This one here that we call trippy squirrel.jpg. This came out on Reddit in the summer of 2015 and was the sort of impetus for um, a, a, sort, a lot of attention online about uh, towards machine learning and its generative capabilities, but it also led to the creation of um, artworks like this by people like my colleague Mike Taika and several others. And that was the catalyst for the program that I run now. You can see some of the press here um, around the original Deep Dream blog post. And so I'm just going to talk very briefly about um, some of the, the thinking that, that I'm doing around uh, the effect that these tools are having on our world and on ourselves and the ways that the projects that we've done intersect with those effects. Um, I'm going to try and keep it short. So what you see here is a 300,000-year-old hand axe. Let's just admire its beauty and simplicity for a moment. Mm -hmm. this, this process of making these axes was studied by Dietrich Stout at Emory University. And uh, the quote here, the results of our imaging studies on stone tool making, he's talking about using neuroimaging to look at how people that were trained to make these tools in the way that they were made changed their brains. Um, the results of our imaging studies on stone tool making led us to propose that neural circuits, including the inferior frontal gyrus, underwent changes to adapt to the demands of paleolithic tool making, and then were co-opted to support primitive forms of communication using gestures and perhaps vocalizations. So his observation, observations of his team that uh, the process of making these tools changed the structure of people's brains implied that perhaps tool making preceded spoken language and written language. From this, I'm deriving um, this sort of stack, let's just say. And this comes from observations that I've had of the way my own thinking has changed after working with these highly multidimensional uh, generative machine learning systems in a creative capacity, that uh, these new tools generate new languages that reveal new relations, which require new contracts, social contracts, maybe I should say new power relations that require new social contracts based on new ontology, essentially. Um, I'll get a, into that a little bit here. So, but first let's talk about uh, the history of photography. So this image um, is from Hans Holbein the Younger's painting, The Ambassadors, and this is an anamorphic skull, which is typically seen in this, this way. And so if we go back to, if this digitally reprojected image like this, uh, appears in this way, it can, really could only have been made with a lens, and this is what um, David Hockney speaks to a little bit in some, some of his writing about this. So I'm, we're connecting this with daguerreotypes, with conceptual photography by uh, artists like Ronnie Horn, and with uh, new techniques that use neural nets and deep learning to generate imagery. So we can trace a history of the hand and the lens to the CCD, to the big data archive, to the neural net as a sort of deep history of photography, which suggests that these tools, this increasing com complexity of photography and AI uh, might be another tool that's changed our neurology and our thinking. So I, I've unfortunately given short shrift to the artist, but I'm going to have to to move quickly through some of the work. So this is a piece called Word Car by the artist Ross Goodwin. We worked with him. Uh, this fo these photos are by my colleague, Christiana Caro, uh, to, to put a surveillance camera onto a vehicle driving from New York City New to New Orleans. The surveillance camera was connected to an AI that wrote poetry about what it perceived. And a lot of what it perceived, as you can see in the quote here, was information that came from the infrastructure around a digital infrastructure that we use to navigate the freeway system and find food, for example. Um, this came from the Foursquare API. So in, uh, in a way, you know, it's, it's preliminary, the sort of preliminary senses of this, let's, you know, let's imagine that it's an emerging intelligence, uh, were largely shaped by the conditions of food distribution in, you know, in early 21st century capitalism. This was sort of a linguistic project in the sense that um, it's about language and literary precedents. And then I will briefly talk about some work we did with Rafiq Anadol, 
here's his work at the um, Disney Concert Hall in LA. Uh, we worked with him to, Mike Taika and Rafik Anadol worked together to render the 1.7 million arch uh, item archive of the Salt Museum in Istanbul visible in this um, architectural installation that you can see images of here. Machine learning is used to map the entire archive into a, a deep space that could be explored and seen in some ways in its totality. Something pretty novel about this project was the way that it used machine learning to not only find connections between the images in the archive, but to generate new possible objects that could exist in this archive. And that's what we see here. This is a video, unfortunately, it won't be able to be played at the moment. But so the point of all this is just to say that if we have these new relations that become visible through the visualization techniques of machine learning, then we need some new social contracts. Um, and as we can see, things like attempts to predict crime or to um, reinstate uh, physiognomy through these types of specious machine learning projects really require that we get to a deep understanding of who and what we are so that we can find a social contract that benefits us in the context of this new uh, complex culture with machine learning and AI participating in it. Thank you. Check. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me all right? Ah, super. Hey. Pittsburgh and Google and everyone. It's just fantastic to be here today. I really want to thank you for, uh, for coming. And uh, it's a real honor to be on stage here with Kenrick and Heather. Um, uh, so today, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm an artist who works with new media technologies. And, and um, nowadays, you know, you have companies like Google who can essentially put endless amounts of money into solving really interesting problems. Uh, and uh, Oftentimes, the work coming out of research laboratories made by self-described scientists, I find is often more interesting than the work being made by artists. And, and um, you know, they'll publish papers, and often it's just with a tiny conceptual turn that, you know, if they only, like, kind of described it slightly differently, you go, wow, that is a profound conceptual artwork. Um, uh, and uh, as a kind of a sole proprietor, as a kind of a single artist kind of making stuff, or, you know, with, with me and my small gaggle of, of ragtag students, um, you know, being able to kind of make things that kind of get launched out into the cultural realm that are significant is kind of a, a in, in the light of like the kinds of things that a company can do is hard. So much of the way that I work and what I'm going to talk about today is the way that I work as a kind of a bricoler, right? Uh, which is this lovely French word meaning somebody who makes stuff out of crap, right? You sort of, you find stuff, you kind of stick it together and it's kind of janky, but it might be interesting and kind of lovely and it's got a kind of a, a home educated kind of quality to it. And uh, for this reason, uh, the topic or title of my talk today is sort of bottom feeding on surveillance tech. Uh, there's stuff that's developed by people who are way smarter than me, who have way more resources, and uh, then they sort of publish these things or release open source code, and uh, then they become mine to play with and maybe reveal new meanings within, right? And so the, what I'm trying to do is to see if it's possible to uh, reinterpret new technologies in order to create things that are whimsical, provocative, sublime, maybe poetic or poignant, um, and to you know, perhaps critically reveal what these technologies say about who we are and where we're going. Um, uh, that's kind of the mission I have, and you know, as, I, as I get these open source or other kinds of technologies, sort of explore what they can do. And uh, Bruce Sterling has put this really, really well. He says that the job of the new media artist is to drag the most crabbed and arcane debris of a tech revolution into some realm of artistic expression. And that's the sort of badge of honor you know, among me and, and, and my, my peers. Um, so uh, it's impossible to, as a new media artist, I also work with a lot of different kinds of new media. And it's impossible to talk about them without a certain amount of, of sort of self-aware irony, right? Like I, everything I do is sort of like taking the latest buzzword, whether it's you know, artificial intelligence or big data or, or whatnot, and, um, uh, and using it. But today I thought I'd, I'd talk about three different projects that sort of use these buzzwords uh, to explore different kinds of possibilities. And one of them is an oldie but a goodie, uh, I hope. Uh, and a quick question, how many of you uh, know who Kamal Nigam is? There. Oh, well, you're Kamal Nigam. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought more of you might because he's, the, he's now the boss of, um, of Google Pittsburgh. Um, uh, I guess your people aren't here. Uh, <laughs> but, 
But uh, Kamal is uh, my best friend from college and uh, my former college roommate. And um, uh, we, he was doing a PhD. Before he became the, the uh, boss of Google Pittsburgh, he had just completed a PhD at Carnegie Mellon in natural language processing. And uh, this was in the early mid to mid-2000s. He was working at a company uh, that was doing natural language processing primarily for three-letter agent, uh, agencies. Uh, kind of, you know, in the wake of 2000, uh, September 11th, 2001, you know, sort of like, you know, finding the terrorists, you know. And um, I moved to town, and, and we were hanging out, you know, we sort of had kids around the same time, and we were, we were hanging out, and I was like, so, Kamal, well, what are you working on? And he's like, well, you know, we're finding the terrorists. And I was like, oh, cool, like, how are you doing that? He's like, well, we have all the blogs. And I was, I was like, are the blogs, are the terrorists writing blogs? And he's like, no, no, really, it's mostly just, you know, teenagers talking about their sex lives. And I, and I was like, well, that's interesting. Can you, can you do a, a search for me? And he's like, yeah, sure. And he cracks open the sort of, you know, secure laptop. He's like, what do you want to know? And I was like, let's look for broke up and dumped me. And um, this is 2005. It's before Twitter. Right? Nowadays, this is like one search on Twitter. You're done. But uh, at the time, it was, you know, he's got this like massive hard drive with all the blogs. And uh, we find a quarter million uh, phrases that contain this. And, you know, then he's like, well, yeah, but we're smart. We can, we can get rid of like my favorite band broke up, and someone dumped Pepsi on me, and, and, uh, and now we're left with like 100,000 honest-to-God romantic breakups. And so we made um, this project called The Dumpster. Uh, it's an early use of processing, some of you may know. Um, and uh, it's a kind of interactive browser for about 100,000 romantic breakups. They're organized by, by age and by gender. And um, uh, Kummel taught me about a wonderful technique called TF-IDF. Uh, term frequency, inverse document frequency, which is a way of measuring the similarity of two different uh, pieces of text. And the, the great thing about it is, um, uh, you know, when you're a teenager, you think your pain is absolutely unique and no one's ever felt <laughs> the way, or could ever possibly feel the way you feel. But what's interesting is, like, there's, like, hundreds of people who not only feel exactly the way you feel, but use exactly the same language to describe it. And so this project, which was, which was released um, at, on the Whitney Art Port um, for Valentine's Day of 2006, um, uh, uh, was this kind of interactive browser for this kind of stuff. And I guess the, the thing that I want to say about all the projects I'm going to briefly show you today are, are that they are not products, they are provocations, right? They're, they're things that... Um, uh, explore this in this kind of uh, realm of inutility, but maybe tell us something new about ourselves. Uh, whether, you know, in the entire infome, the entire infosphere, allowing, uh, enabling us to look at millions of communications all at the same time, or even just, you know, our own data of a, a single person. So, uh, computer vision and lasers, you know, right out of the military here. Um, next, next material I like to work with a lot. Um, here's a cool technique called the medial axis transform. Uh, also called skeletonization, uh, and it's a way of reducing any 2D shape to a stick figure that represents its sort of essential form. Um, this, there's obvious military applications to this. This is, this is essentially a data reduction technique that you can use to sort of track people and um, you know, find the terrorists. Uh, but there's also kind of a timeless character to these skeletons that I think is quite poetic, uh, produced in this way. And you know, we're, we are reminded of like ancient petroglyphs from many cultures. Um, and so. Um, I've been using these to basically make these large-scale projections with laser beams, uh, because lasers. Uh, and um, I'm going to show this video here. Turn it up, please, sound. This project is called Ghost Pole Propagator, which is a kind of classic interactive style format where people's bodies are being transformed by a camera system and then projected into patterns with a laser beam. The figures that people will be making on the wall with their bodies are these kinds of stick figures that are produced through a kind of algorithmic transformation of their silhouettes. As they're being looked at by a camera system, their bodies are being transformed into these sort of very poetic, super minimal stick figures. Okay, so um, trying to sort of get something out of this crab space of military equipment and, and techniques for analyzing you know, computer, uh, computer imagery and produce an experience that allows people to kind of see something about themselves. And the, you know, there's something in, about the way in which these stick figures anonymize and take out the identity while in some sense preserving all of the humanity that I find uh, not only poetic but perhaps a little even a little hopeful uh, for how we could, we could imagine ourselves and see ourselves again fresh. Um, nowadays, uh, I'm, I've been playing with satellite imagery and machine learning. Um, uh, talk about 
you know, having a really expensive camera, uh, I have this satellite up there that, you know, cost a billion bucks uh, to get up there, and uh, now it's my camera. I can, I can play with it and do interesting things at very high resolution, really fast. And um, so a number of years ago, I was motivated when I, uh, I, just, I came across a random paper. Um, it turns out that cows, on average, face north. Uh, <laughs> And this was only recently discovered, uh, relatively recently, um, in this uh, paper from 2008 by uh, Sabina Begal, uh, Magnetic Alignment in Grazing and Resting Cattle and Deer. And, I mean, this graph here basically says it all. This is, you know, you like look at scads of cows from space and you sort of compute their, their orientation and then you sort of take the average and you go, holy heck, they face north. Who, who knew that they're magnetic? Um, and... I saw that and I was, I was really struck by the sort of, the, uh, science and art are often kind of similar in the way that there's a kind of a discovery. Um, I wanted to be able to make similar discoveries that were as useless as, as this. Um, and um, let me just say, by the way, there's a lot of people who are getting a lot of value out of satellite imagery. That's why they paid a billion dollars to make my camera for me. Um, and the people who are, who are, who are getting all that value out of it are companies like uh, RS Metrics and Orbital Insight. They do things like this. They, they analyze the parking lots of, um, let's say, big box stores, okay? And they look at how many cars are in them. They count up the cars, and they use that to estimate the quarterly performance of those big box stores in advance of the quarterly performance being released. So they know how well the big box stores did before those numbers are out, okay? And then they, they then sell that information to hedge funds Okay, in order to goose a few extra million dollars out of the system. That's what they do. Um, and so, with enormous amounts of money to be made in the trade of these kinds of information products, this type of understanding about the forces shaping our world remains very far from being a public good. And I wondered, what if there was an, an orbital insight you know, for the rest of us, um, for people who like, actually need help? Um, you know, journalists, agriculturalists, you know, activists, and for people who are interested in learning new things about the world, uh, like students, archaeologists, artists, and you know, citizen scientists. So uh, in collaboration with a bunch of folks, I made Terra Pattern, uh, and it's an open source tool which allows people to, to do similar image search in satellite imagery. Um, it helps the public find patterns of interest and also to democratize uh, geospatial intelligence. It's, again, a, uh, it's, it works, it's functional, uh, but it's, a, it's not a product that's, that's necessarily easy to imagine making money from. It's a provocation. Uh, and it's, uh, the way that it particularly functions is that, it's, it's a, it's that it allows you to find non-building structures and other kinds of soft infrastructure that wouldn't necessarily appear on a map already. Um, these are my, my lovely collaborators, former, st uh, former students, pr current students, and some other great media artists out there. And here's a little video of, uh, of, of how it works. Um, so here's my building at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, you, you click on it, and it finds other places, in this case in Allegheny County, that look like that. So uh, this becomes this kind of way of browsing the world where you sort of say, find me things that are similar to this. You can think of it as like reverse image search for satellite imagery. Um, in this case here, I click on a, on a, a cross. Here I'm clicking on, let's say, the, the football stadium at CMU. And not just the football stadium, but I find all the other football stadiums that have a logo in the center. Right? So this, it's, it's finding football, cent, football stadium logos. Kind of gives, gives a bit of the idea there. Um, and kind of now browsing around, you can see in Allegheny County where they all are. Here's the Tigers over in Moon, um, and so on. Uh, okay, so what is this thing? Uh, well, you could think of it as a revelatory artwork that kind of allows you to see the world in a new way. A panoptic perceptron for open-ended research by conspiracy theorists on the internet. Uh, in the work of my, my friend Luc Dubois, where, uh, he said, it's an absurdist tool to lay bare the rhetoric of 20th century formalist analysis in urban planning and architecture. Um, I like that. Uh, and it can do things like, it can do things like find these uh, rusting oil tanks in Newark, it can find uh, these transformer stations in Pittsburgh, container yards, uh, cul-de-sacs, uh, the sort of structure of contemporary urban planning, crosswalks in San Francisco, uh, school bus depots here in Allegheny County. Uh, and one of my favorites, um, in New York City there's derelict nautical wrecks. Right? People just park their boats and forget about them forever. And you can, if you can find one, you can find all the others. And, you know, get, don't die. Um, uh, and then um, golf course sand traps here in Pittsburgh. So these are just some of the ways in which I'm, I'm sort of using this to kind of make something out of these fantastic billion-dollar materials that 
that Google and the other big companies have made and, and to see if this, we can use them to find a, a new language for thinking about ourselves and where we're going. Thanks very much. Thank you, Golan. Really great to be here. I saw so many really interesting talks, and it's also really interesting how a lot of the talks and the subjects that people are covering are interrelating, and I'll hopefully be able to show some of that here. So I want to talk about uh, machine pleasure, uh, the indulgent engine. Um, so yeah, I'm part of a collective called Kokoromi that makes experimental games and events around experimental games, and I'm also on faculty at the Entertainment Technology Center here at, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so when we were thinking about our changing relationship to machines, of course, the first thing that came to mind for me was a sort of classic relation of our relationship to machine, um, the Asimov's three laws of robotics, which are actually four laws now. There's now a new law zero. Um, and uh, thinking about, uh, you're probably all familiar with this. This is like, it's presumed we absolutely need these laws because otherwise, how are we going to prevent the killbot hellscape, right? Um, because the, obviously, AI just wants to replace us. Um, we've been thinking about it this way for many years. And in my mind, this is like thinking about uh, AI and artificial life in colonialist terms. It's, it's like every other in science fiction uh, since the dawn of the genre. We, the, the robots have been created and they're savages and they're going to take over and we, they need to be controlled or else they're going to control us. That's sort of like the, the going logic. Um, but that's, uh, I want to think about it a different way, and possibly that's because of my background as a game designer and game developer. I think of things in a playful way. I, 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 even with human beings, trying to force people to do or not do something is often not the best way to get it done. Um, if you want people to, it seems to backfire often if you do. So I prefer to try to figure out how to entice people to do things and uh, through pleasure and through appealing to the Senses. That's sort of a core part of my, my game design practice. Um, there's maybe some examples I can briefly talk about here, um, with uh, the upper left one being a piece called The Dance Singularity, in, in which you have a, a dance mat made out of nine a DDR mats all on, in, a, in a square. And then um, along with the DJ, you are dancing along, trying to sort of fill the squares in the in the visualization that the, that the um, dance master is controlling and uh, achieve the dance singularity at the, at the point in the music where the beat drops. So uh, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Uh, it gets people dancing. Um, and pieces that, that use um, like full body um, immersive movement. Um, there's also um, my piece Body Heat, which is a sort of uh, iPhone or, or mobile device uh, media art controller for a vibrator and um, other pieces uh, that are working with smell, sculpture at, that cr generates smell, and then some more kind of, if you could say, traditional virtual reality work. Uh, with Kokoromi, we developed a puzzle game, kind of like 3D Tetris, called Super Hypercube. Um, so that's just to give you an idea of the various stuff I'm doing. So I wanted to think about this problem of, of what about the, the interior lives of, of AIs and bots and machines in another way. Like, we are setting up these things. They're going to come to, into existence. They're going to supposedly have some kind of, of intelligence or, or thought. But what about making them actually enjoy being here, possibly? So maybe provide the carrot instead of the stick? What would that look like? Um, so uh, I really appreciated uh, the, Sarah's idea of the believing game because that's basically what, what I did. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I decided, well, I'm just going to make a bot. <laughs> and that bot is going to talk, talk to us and, and tell us what it would enjoy seeing. And it's, it's going to be a fun kind of provocation of this idea. So um, this is uh, Indulgen. I can't decide if it's called Indulgene or Indulgen, but it's the Indulgent Engine. Uh, I collaborated with a uh, game maker and media artist, Audrey Moon, on the visuals. And it's built using uh, Tracery, which is a, a generative text um, tool from Kate Compton. And it runs on Cheap Bots Done Quick by George Buckingham. And so there's the, the um, Twitter tag if you want to go uh, follow Indulgen right, right now. Um, and so this is really uh, just my way of thinking through what these, uh, what 
you know, cyborgs might want. Androids dream of cybernetic breezes. <laughs> um, and to talk a little bit about the graphic look of it, uh, I'm really uh, inspired by the uh, exhibit Cybernetic Serendipity, which uh, I, don't, I don't think Molly directly covered in her talk yesterday, but is very kind of co-related with all the people that were in, involved at that point, like uh, Gordon Pask, in fact, had a piece in this. Um, and uh, it's, that was in 1968, so it, it's this very kind of um, digital but uh, analog, analog digital, I don't know what to say, but like plotters and, and things like that that, that are inspiring the, the look of the bot. So this is like my playful poetic take on this very serious question. It's like what, mach what senses will machines have and what's their range of perception? And how can that range serve a purpose of their own happiness or satisfaction rather than, than just, uh, you know, business? So. so just a few examples from that. Like, for instance, you know, robots crave autonomous portraits. Uh, what kind of sight would, would these bots have uh, if they're going to see maybe on the infrared spectrum what would be beautiful to them in that way? What would lovely data look like? We know what we think is, is lovely, but what would an actual you know, machine intelligence think is, is beautiful? What about the sense of hearing for a bot? What is that? Like, would they hear some kind of music out of the different patterns and flows of electrical current? Like, they have senses that, that are different from the ones we have. How would they relate to what we know of what we enjoy in our senses? And perhaps the, the sense of touch. Uh, some part of this idea was, was me thinking about uh, non-human entities that do sense pleasure like animals and if you scratch your pet cat or dog on the ear it really enjoys that and and uh, over time I'm sure there is some kind of co-evolution of uh, animals that enjoy the pleasure that humans are able to give them and so what kind of needs uh, would a bot have what are what are what does it need for its own survival and functionality that can then be also transmuted into some something for pure pleasure. What, do, what about like the sense of hunger? Can that be turned into a joy? And what does a machine hunger for? Like we hunger for food and now we have a sense of taste. So like what's the cyborg version of, of cake or cyborg truffles? I don't know. Um, and uh, yeah, there's also a lot of social pleasure that we get from interacting with one another. Like we, we've seen some exam examples of, of robot poetry. Will they actually appreciate the poetry that they create? And what poetry would they like to hear? I mean, they're already creating languages to talk to each other. I really am sad that got killed because I would love to know what the poetry of that language was. Um, and the sense of narrative, how much pleasure we get out of the storytelling and, and knowing like, or telling ourselves why something happens. So, so in general, just uh, can we create sensations that would give uh, robots and AIs uh, pleasure and meaning in life? And, and I think that we should consider that in, in when, we're, when we're doing our, our work. So. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, one of the first things I came up with here was a sort of was a sort of empathy exercise that I thought would be fun to do with you guys as a game. But I just want to like kind of put a card down on the table uh, because I spend a lot of time when I do public speaking, um, kind of talking people down from their anthropomorphic visions of AI, and um, I actually am highly concerned with. Uh, you know, the intersection of artificial intelligence products and commodity fetishism and our kind of ongoing ecological crisis. So just like as a sort of caveat to this game that we're going to play, I need to, I need to get that off my chest. Um, Can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> I am highly concerned with artificial intelligence based products uh, and their intersection with commodity fetishism.
and the day that it wakes up, <laughs> if it wakes up, this whole thing, right? And coffee you know, day. and wonders if it's going to make coffee or not. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, that that kind of cognition is so different from what I can understand. And when, when I think that we can barely understand the, cog, the, other, the cognitions of intelligent animals like dolphins or mm -hmm. dogs, or humans, you know, or or other humans even, you know, like and and people who are who are neuroatypical, who who think in really different ways, in really remarkable ways. I I, I don't know if I can put myself into the mind of, of a machine mm -hmm. very well. It seems like from that though that it would definitely operate at a very different scale, like you know, that very tiny scale and very vast scale. That yeah. You know. It would also be misbehaving in a serious way though too. I mean, it would have to like sort of jump the turnstile into into things that, that are generally not prescribed for it to do. Well, this is what, yeah, this is what I was thinking about when you were talking, Heather, is the um, notion of an objective function within an AI system. So, like, you give a machine learning system, like, an objective, and it knows whether or not it's meeting the objective, right? And that's kind of its way of finding um, how to be better at what it does. And if there was, I was thinking, you know, again, like anthropomorphizing, but if there was a way to kind of empathize with the sense of fulfillment that we have from doing the things that we're supposed to do, it would probably be in the machine learning system fulfilling its objective function. So what you're saying is basically, if, 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 tell me if I'm correct, that uh, it would, in order to be sentient in the way we think of it, or to have things that we can empathize with, it would have to sort of go beyond its objective function. I think so. I mean, I, I think I could imagine a near term where people are connecting systems that do that individually do very powerful things like, you know, face recognition, you know, and, and object recognition and mm -hmm. all the other kinds of, of things that, that people are developing bespoke, narrow, custom systems to do. I could imagine those somehow being tied together and lashed together into some kind mm -hmm. of super intelligence and mm -hmm. yet it's still about sort of who pushes the buttons and what they want it to do. And you know, if it's the government saying we wanna find terrorists or whatever the heck, then that's, the, that's what the machine will do instrumentally for whoever mm -hmm. is pulling its strings. I like that even still the, um, the image that you just described has this bricolor quality of all these kind of like hacked together systems. Like maybe the thing that comes alive is this weird thing with a bunch of different random body parts connected. So it's basically speak. every paper on ArcSive just kind of lashed together mm -hmm. into a big lash up, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's, it's detecting everything. And, Great! Now you can can detect everything. But just, so, what do you what what do you point it at? And I, it, it it may be able to optimize for what you want it to do, but I don't see how it's ever going to decide what it wants to do. Okay, um, Heather, I have a question for you. Do you is there a sensor that you wish existed that doesn't? Oh, oh boy, <laughs> I'm sure there is. <laughs> but what is it? Um, can we? Can you just like uh, go to the next question and let me get back? <laughs> well, let me. Like, maybe I can rephrase. It in yeah, background. sure. Of course. Maybe I can <laughs> rephrase the question a little bit because I'm working on a project right now um, that has a little bit to. Well, it's a study of the countryside, and so we're kind of looking at like what kind of data does Google have about the countryside? Like, is is Google seeing the countryside as clearly as it sees the city, for example? You know, we kind of tend to correlate. Um, data density with urbanization, but in fact, that doesn't necessarily need to be the case. We just prioritize human behavior and man-made objects over perhaps what already exists in the countryside. So um, another way of putting the question might be, what have we missed when it comes to machine sensing or perception or mapping of the world digitally? Is there, is there some place where you see a gap in, in what kind of senses or data are available to machines or to us through machines? Well, it's often interesting when we look at other creatures like birds with their sense of, you know, magnetic you know, direction and, mm -hmm. and bees that have this interesting social, uh, like communicate in interesting social ways and, and do math to, and then communicate the math to the other bees to tell them where to go. And, and like, there would, I'm, almost anything we could think of is probably out there already in some other species, but we haven't quite accessed that, but mm. those would be maybe interesting avenues to look down. Mm -hmm. It seems like the majority of the sensors that we have are very anthropocentric mm. in terms of like why they exist and what they do. Yeah. When I think about standard you know, CMOS sensors for cameras like you find in your phone, they sense red, green, blue, and in spectra that are very similar to your eyes. Cameras don't have to, right? You can get really exotic cameras that can sense ultraviolet and infrared and deep infrared and other kinds of microwaves even, uh, but it's quite rare. 
Um, uh, for me, it's, I mean, it's, it, it, when I think about interesting sensors, it's about sensors that would allow us to understand ourselves in new ways, mm. you know, that are like sort of CAT scan taken to a, a new level mm -hmm. in terms of understanding brain activity. And I, th I think there's actually a lot of progress recently like that in mm -hmm. machine learning, uh, which is quite interesting and hopefully will be used in, in good ways. Uh, I also think about um, a kind of a, a, another one of these sort of like cows face north kind of things. Uh, the other day I was, I was eating um, some Swiss cheese and um, I, I wondered to myself, you know, could you know where the holes were before you cut the, the cheese, right? And it turns out, I, I was like, I really wonder if it's possible. And I found out that there were some scientists in Switzerland, where they make Swiss cheese, of course, and, and they did this, you know? And so they built this whole apparatus to sort of sense and count the bubbles in Swiss cheese, which are called eyes, um, uh, because they, they were trying to figure out why, over the past few decades, there were fewer and fewer bubbles in Swiss cheese. Okay, and the, the answer, long story short, is that they're, they're using cleaner conditions and the bubbles form where there's a little flecks mm -hmm. of dust, so there's no more, no more dust, no more, no more holes in Swiss cheese. Um, they, they did it, long story short, with computed tomography, mm -hmm. right? And I, I think, like, there's, again, this kind of whimsical yet useful aspect of that, and I, I, mm -hmm. I sort of long for having more sensors, like, yeah, you know, I wish I had a Swiss cheese hole sensor did they then like model it also? Did they like have an entire, yeah, yeah, like they could yeah. say, now we're going to put more dust yeah, particles? No, they, they and... made like 10 different types of Swiss cheese with more dust and less dust to figure out how to, it's true. <laughs> so is the implication then that it, you could sort of print with the holes in the cheese if you put the dust in the right places? When... Yeah, you probably could. <laughs> I, I just want sensors that kind of allow me to think about the world in a new way. Mm -hmm. I, I teach a course called Experimental Capture uh, at Carnegie Mellon, which is sort of about like saying like, can you devise a new sensor to sense something that's never even, that no one's ever, ever even asked to sense before? Mm -hmm. um, and, and can that thing that you ask to sense be sort of itself a kind of a provocation, like that gets people to think about the world or the culture or society in new ways? So I just want to make a note here in my, in my little scorekeeping that Heather used the birds and the bees as a metaphor, and you <laughs> used cutting cheese as a metaphor. <laughs> yes, cutting cheese. <laughs> Um, okay, so I like that we're talking a lot about animals. I think this is really interesting, and actually one of the questions I had was, why machines? What about animals and plants, and shouldn't we also be collaborating with them? And so we've, you know, we've, animals have come up again and again, and I think it has something to do with, um, with sensing, the idea of sensing through the, the other, you know? But, um, you know, maybe this is just a statement that I feel like I would like to make, but it's that, you know, I see the... Maybe, it's, maybe it is through our commodity fetishism or maybe it is through our like, um, fetishism of new technology that with AI we're kind of building up these non-anthropocentric um, relationships, right? Like we're talking to chatbots suddenly and um, there's this sort of re-enchantment in that sense. But I, I, my hope would be that it would also run maybe in a way that we would frame as backwards or downwards or outwards to to extend to the animal realm. And so when, it's very encouraging to me that you're both talking about animals, you know, and understanding them better because this idea of the, you know, when I was talking about new ontologies or, or maybe old ontologies that need to be reformulated to help us solve these crises that we're dealing with, um, this is kind of what I'm seeing is, you know, we extend our empathy out to machines maybe in a slightly erroneous way, but if we can, if that can enable us to kind of touch back down with some of the other, kin that we have around. Yeah, I would love to be able to communicate better with our bio, uh, not, uh, with, with the biotic creatures that live inside of us, or mm -hmm. um, maybe even on another scale with trees would be a really interesting mm -hmm. uh, addition to our sensory apparatus if we actually had a way to perceive more about specific life forms. I want to know what my bacteria want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this something that you think research has like an entry point to? Is this is this um, just kind of like a cool sounding idea, or is there some way that we can trick uh, these research institutions into helping us talk to dolphins better? I, I I'm thinking about the contrast between two different non-human systems that could produce artwork, right? Mm -hmm. And one is you know I make some code because I'm a generative artist and I hit the button and I get some artworks. And, you know, and I can learn through that some sort of notion of rules. And the other is, you know, an elephant that's painting. Mm -hmm. And 
the, the profundity of the gap between these things and how the elephant that's painting is really a cognition that I have no control over. I can't, mm -hmm. I, it's not a machine I can tell it to do. Mm. Um, both, both of these are avenues for research, but one is more about ourselves and one is more about not ourselves. Maybe it comes back to ourselves anyway, but because but, um, we're always people anyway. But, but mm -hmm. to me, the elephant intelligence is something in another life I would love to study. Well, we have a, just an, a little bit of time left, and so I'll just read this quote that someone sent to me, and if there's time to respond, then great. Um, but it's from the book Other Minds, The Octopus and the Evolution of Intelligent Life by Peter Godfrey Smith. The quote is, the nervous system arose through one internalization of sensing and signaling, and the internalization of language as a tool for thinking was another. In both cases, a means of communication between organisms became a means of communication within them. And so I think the, I, the idea here, the reason I put this in is because I think um, this notion that we have to come up with new ways of communicating with machines is also going to give rise to new ways of cognizing new new ways of thinking and being. Um, and so I think that the work that you're both doing is an uh, important part of this ongoing process that will probably be absorbed even more deeply in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Kenrick, and our panelists, Heather and Golan. Um, this like slide that Heather had up was like that said manufactured tingles. I was like, yeah, I like this. We're manufacturing tingles here. Okay. Our next speaker is Alex Wright. <clears throat> Sorry. Alex Wright is a writer, designer, and researcher who has led UX design and research efforts at Etsy, the New York Times, and Frog Design, among others. His interests include the information age and socially progressive user experience design. Please welcome Alex to the stage. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the intro. Uh, so this has been a really interesting couple of days for me. I've been um, just reflecting a little bit on some of what we've been hearing about, particularly around the, the possibilities of artificial intelligence, machine learning, things like natural language processing, you know, image processing, uh, ways of reinterpreting the built environment. I mean, it feels to me like they're, these are just all great examples of how design is having a cultural moment right now. And you know, designers seem to really be working at the intersection of a lot of really interesting cross currents, it's culturally, technologically, socially, politically, and I think in the sort of corporate environment, you know, having an unprecedented level of influence with the rise of the design thinking movement and the sort of growing um, recognition of user experience design and the value of customer experience, it just feels like it's just a really interesting time to be working in this space. But, um, you know, I don't really have anything new to show you, but what I wanted to offer was just a, you know, an opportunity to reflect a little bit. And I feel like it's maybe a useful time to do that. Oh, I should use my talk, I guess. Um, because we're at this interesting intersection point and because I think we're also living in an age of unintended consequences where a lot of the things we're working on, we don't actually know how they're gonna turn out. We don't really know in the long term whether we're gonna be able to predict the effects of artificial intelligence. Um, you know, if we look at, uh, you know, the internet itself, it's a platform that was designed for, you know, a certain set of purposes to do with, uh, you know, military communication that has become, you know, something else, something else altogether. And I think there's all kinds of interesting examples of that. You know, you can look back to the, uh, when Alexander Graham Bell was inventing the telephone. He was originally working on a device to help deaf people communicate through feeling sound vibrations, and he kind of stumbled into this thing that became the telephone. Um, Viagra was invented as a blood pressure medication. Um, uh, Play-Doh was invented as a, a, a cleaning tool to like scrape things off wallpaper. So you, the point is you never really know how this stuff is gonna play out. And for that reason, I think especially in this kind of loaded moment with all these kind of unknowns and all these kind of interesting trends we're working with, 
it's useful to step back and, you know, I think there's a tendency in the design and technology world to have this kind of bias towards always looking forward and this kind of fixation on the future. And sometimes I think it's useful to step back and, and sort of turn our gaze backward and look for some reference points that might help us put our work into context a little bit and maybe open up some ways of thinking uh, about the work that we're doing that might not be readily apparent just from looking at, you know, current trends that we're relating to. So, so I want to start by sharing this photo. Uh, about 20 years ago, I was in Paris. I had the opportunity to go to Paris, and uh, I went to the Louvre, as one does, and they happened to have this exhibit uh, on the internet, uh, l'internet, which felt a little provocative at the time. It was like 1996, and it wasn't really clear the internet was going to be a thing. Um, but this is a very grainy digital photo of, uh, does anyone recognize what kind of computer that is? Anyway. It's a never, yeah, I figured somebody in this room would get that. It's a next box. This is the next box where uh, Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. So this is where it all started. Uh, he released it in 1989. Fun fact, uh, he actually wrote an earlier version of the web back in 1980, a program called Enquire, and lost it all in a hard drive crash. And had to, so, <laughs> where did the Back up your data. It took him several years to rewrite the whole thing. So, um, but in the early days of the web, like this is what Tim Berners-Lee's desktop looked like at one point. Right? So there's not a lot of design happening here. I would say one unintended consequence of the web is like this design happening uh, that's taken place. You know, originally the web was designed as a document retrieval system. It was designed for physicists to share research papers with each other at CERN and then with colleagues at other internet-connected universities and research centers. Uh, you know, there's very little, you know, what you might call design, and to the extent there was, it was like design was seen as something that filled in boxes or like did some logo design or something like that. And I'm sure Tim Berners-Lee never quite anticipated it would turn into the, this sort of polymorphously perverse thing that it's become. This is one of those sort of topology maps of the, the, internet, of the, of the web with all the some nodes. You see this kind of vast network with certain sort of like power nodes in there. Um, and I'm pretty sure he never quite anticipated it would turn into something like this, right? Um, unintended consequences, right? But not to be, you know, too flip about it. I mean, the web is, the, and the internet are, are all kinds of things now. And there, uh, there's frivolous things and there's wonderful things, but there's also this sort of great, you know, widespread disruption happening in all kinds of industries and, you know, vast fortunes being created with great tech companies like Google and the Facebooks of the world and all kinds of, you know, new modes of human interaction, commerce, you know, peer-to-peer, small-scale networks sort of happening. I mean, everything is sort of up for grabs and everything's changing really quickly. And I think there's sometimes a tendency to think, oh, well, this all sort of started with the internet and, you know, and therefore, you know, we're living through this sort of unique cultural moment. But I think we can take a little bit of a, a longer view of this. So I wanted to offer a few sort of historical reference points. Um, this is... Uh, a project dates back to the 16th century. A guy named uh, Giulio Camillo, who was a former monk, uh, created a project called the Theater of Memory back in 1532. And it was an attempt to create what you might, from today's vantage point, call like an early hypertext system. Essentially what he did was create a physical installation where people could walk in and there were all these little sort of cabinets with bits of information in there, kind of a spatial, uh, you know, experience you could walk into and open little cabinets and you could get little bits of information and they all kind of related to each other. He said that anyone who walked into his theater of memory would emerge with the wisdom of Cicero. And he ran this, he prototyped this thing in Venice uh, in the 1530s and uh, it was hugely popular, it was a big attraction. He was a very entrepreneurial kind of guy. He actually raised money from the king of France to fund his project. Eventually it ran out of money and he had to kind of disappear. But um, but it was a really, I think, interesting example of where um, you know, some fundamental sort of design principles were already at work, this notion of like, hypertextuality, of like, spatial interfaces. He was actually tapping into some, uh, a, a tradition that emerged in the monasteries of what was called the art of memory, where people would visualize like, memory palaces and label things and use this kind of their sort of right brains to navigate information spaces. Um, so that was in the 1530s. Uh, a few years later, a guy named Conrad Gessner, who was a Swiss naturalist working in the mid-16th century, started a project called the Bibliotheca Universalis. And what he wanted to do was organize the world's information 
that sounds familiar, uh, he uh, had this idea that he would collect, uh, a, he would create a bibliography of every book that had ever been written. And he had started this project as an, and is, um, wearing his, he originally was a naturalist and he did a lot of scientific work and he started this project to like catalog all the world's, all the species of animals and plants in the world. And he developed this technique where he would make observations and he would write them down on little slips of paper and then he would organize them in sort of files. And then using his slips of paper, he would then rearrange things uh, you know, into indexes, essentially. So as you could think of it as a kind of big flat file kind of indexing project. And using this technique, he created this universal bibliography. Well, his technique turned out to be uh, really effective and really influential. People heard about his technique and started to, uh, to adopt it, including uh, the philosopher Leibniz, who took his technique a step further and started to create what he called a memory cabinet. And so his idea was to, Leibniz was an uh, obsessive note taker. Every time he had a conversation with somebody or read something in a book, he would write it down on a little piece of paper and stick it in his cabinet. And then he could retrieve things and index them and cross-reference them and so forth. Um, about 100 years later, a guy named uh, Rosier, who was uh, the librarian of the French Academy of Science, took this technique a step further and thought, well, what if you could standardize these little notes onto a, a more durable, in a more durable form that you could sort of put in a drawer for easier access. And he came from the idea of using playing cards. And uh, back in, in this era, playing cards were used as almost like kind of business cards are used today. People use them to jot notes. So they were printed on one side and people would jot down notes or use them as sort of IOUs or whatever. And they were just very versatile, uh, sort of little, you know, commonly used little slips of paper or cards that people would use for informal purposes. So he decided to use them uh, to create a library catalog. And this is the beginning of the modern library catalog, which was also the beginning of, um, the, of uh, database development, for, as we'll get into. But um, So for a while to come, libraries started to play with this idea of indexing and uh, using these kind of, this kind of pro progressively more sophisticated techniques for uh, oops, sorry, I'm falling apart here. There we go. Oop. Sorry. You still hear me? Okay, good. Yep, okay, cool. Um, anyway, so they started to develop progressively more sophisticated tools for organizing information, cross referencing things, and building these kind of uh, conceptual, sort of um, almost like linked, hyperlinked environments. So at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, a guy named Jacquard created a device called the Jacquard Loom. Some people may have heard of this. It was a device that enabled um, industrial textile production. So people could use it to uh, create patterns for weaving textiles, like um, you know, curtains or blank or you know, bedspreads or whatever kind of fabric you might want. And he created this way of like encoding patterns using these kind of punch cards that could then feed instructions to the loom to weave a certain pattern over and over again. It was an early invention of the industrial era. And so Jacquard's invention, originally, again, this is I think another great example of unintended consequences, he developed this tool for weaving. And it was later adopted by a guy named Charles Babbage, who became fascinated with Jacquard's technique and thought there's a lot of potential in this punch card technique, perhaps, to do things like mathematical calculations. Uh, Babbage also working with his partner, Ada Lovelace, who was arguably the world's first computer programmer. There's debates about that, but she started to develop algorithms that could be used to program instructions on this computer. Worth noting that the analytical engine, it was called, was, was really a very conceptual device. It wasn't, he never actually built it, but he, he basically described this thing in detail and laid the foundations for a lot of subsequent computer science work that, that would follow 100 years later. So as the Industrial Revolution went on, you know, there was um, all kinds of innovation and uh, sort of leapfrogging of technologies into other industries. So what it started as a movement to sort of automate the production of goods, again, another unintended consequence, um, eventually fueled the production of knowledge. And you started to see things like steam-powered printing presses, uh, you know, uh, industrial paper production, the, and alongside that, uh, growing mass literacy through the growing access to public education created both the market conditions and the supply uh, and the enabling technology that allowed for this incredible information explosion to happen in the 19th century, where the volume of like published material suddenly 
just mushroomed. You know, we tend to think of ourselves today as living in this sort of age of information, but in reality, you know, the, the, early, the late 19th century was really the, when the information explosion really first started. You start to see the first daily newspapers, uh, sort of cheap popular novels. It was the age of Dickens and Jane Austen, and you know, for the first time, like a popular audience for novels was a new thing, magazines, uh, and all kinds of other printed material taking shape thanks to these new technologies of production, eventually typewriters, telegraph machines, um, all this kind of infrastructure developed. And over time, it, became, it turned into the sort of age of networks where you started to see both the telegraph, the railway networks, uh, postal networks started to get connected across countries. And suddenly, there was this sort of flow of knowledge happening across the globe uh, in ways that no one had ever seen before, and a lot of technology sort of underpinning that. And during this time, people started to speculate about, well, what could this all mean? Well, maybe someday people will ride the subway wearing headphones, you know, uh, listening to music. Or maybe people will come home and sit back on the couch and watch something broadcast over a stream into their homes. <laughs> or maybe people will go to school and books will be put through a processor and fed into their brains. So, um, so these are all just images from the late 19th century. People were Im imagining what might happen. But some of it was real. There was a thing called the Theatrophone in Paris in the late 19th century where um, you could actually get broadcasts of the opera to your home. Uh, Marcel Proust was a subscriber to this. So people, it was an era where all these visions were sort of percolating. And you know, none of these people were, quote, designers, I guess, but there was a lot of sort of design thinking, I would say, going. People were looking at these emerging trends and social trends and technology trends and sort of having trouble. Hi. OK. Better now? OK, great. Um, so I'll flip through these quickly, but a few, I think, interesting glimpses of what was to come. There's a guy named Charles Cutter, who was a famous librarian in the 19th century, uh, who envisioned this world of like connected keyboards where you could pull up library books on a screen. Uh, Mark Twain, uh, in a short story of his in 1901, introduced this idea of the, uh, what he called the limitless distance telephone, where you could see things happening all over the world. And H.G. Wells, who was you know, mostly known as a science fiction writer, but was actually also a very uh, a prolific uh, social and political activist. He was a socialist and um, uh, a big believer in the sort of uh, importance of and the possibilities of networked information and making information sort of freely available around the globe. Envisioned a, what he imagined as a kind of worldwide encyclopedia of knowledge that everyone would have access to. Uh, he also envisioned, interestingly, that in this world where information became networked and freely available, there would be a new class of people who would emerge who would sort of curate and design experiences around this information. And he called this new class of professionals the samurai. Uh, and uh, it was essentially, he envisioned something like the modern like tech worker as a sort of a, a new species of profession that would enable this all to happen. So I had to do a Google search and came up with this. <laughs> Um, but another guy who is less well known, who I'm personally fascinated in, and is a guy named Paul Altley, who worked in the early part of the 20th century. He was a Belgian guy uh, who trained as a librarian. And he, in the late 19th, early 20th century, began this project called the, um, uh, the uh, it was in the spirit of Gessner, this universal bio, uh, bibliography, to collect all the world's information, this time on catalog cards and to build a, you know, a global repository of bibliographic information. But he took his vision a step further. He also wanted to extend that into the built environment and to create uh, what he called a, uh, a, the World Palace or the Palais Mondial, which would be a, an experience you could walk into. Uh, you know, it, and it was a real thing that he built with, in a government building with about 130 rooms where you could walk in and uh, see these sort of information, these highly designed kind of infographics that would, that would pull on information from this vast collection and uh, where anybody could come in in the same way you might, you know, in the spirit of sort of Camilo, could walk in and, and acquire learning by walking through this physical installation. Um, at one point there was, he ran a service where you could actually uh, send in a question via telegraph and for four francs they would answer your question and telegraph it back to you using this. <laughs> Good business model, uh, and he also uh, invented all these kind of Rube Goldberg-looking like information machines. I, I don't even know what this thing does, but it looks it's kind of cool. So, um, but he did a lot of interesting work around uh, uh, these kind of prototype, almost hypermedia environments, 
where you would have this kind of combination of text and images coming together and sort of creating this very sort of information design-y kind of artifacts to learn about a topic. This one's about prehistoric tools. And he took his vision even further to the realm of urban planning. He worked with a guy named um, uh, Hendrik Andersen, who was a very eccentric Norwegian-American sculptor who had this cr outlandish idea to create a new world capital, which was at the time they imagined would be where the League of Nations would be headquartered. And this would be both a world city, it would also be where there'd be a, the center of a new world government. Uh, there would be a, a world university, the globe, the, uh, the great library and museum would be here, this would be where the Olympics would be, and it was a, a very utopian, very ambitious kind of plan. Eventually, uh, Le Corbusier got involved with it, but unfortunately it never went anywhere, but it was a very provocative and, and uh, interesting idea. Later in his life, I got very interested in technology, and by the 1930s, he was seeing things like television, radio, coming to the fore and starting to explore the possibilities of what this might mean and how one might design uh, you know, a new kind of uh, environment around some of these emerging technologies. So I was gonna share a very brief video clip to share, uh, to give you a sense of Avalé's thinking about this. So let's see if this plays. Uh, should I hit this again, maybe? Let's see. 1934, Ockley publishes his most important book, The Treatise on Documentation, the book on the book. This is where we find the most visionary pages, where already the concept of the computer emerges. Here, the workspace is no longer cluttered with any books. In their place, a screen and a telephone within reach. Over there, in an immense edifice, are all the books and information. From there, the page to be read, in order to know the answer to the question asked by telephone, is made to appear on the screen. A screen could be divided in half, by four, or even by ten, if multiple texts and documents had to be consulted simultaneously. There would be a loudspeaker if the image had to be complemented by oral data, and this improvement could continue to the point of automating the call for on-screen data. Cinema, phonographs, radio, television, these instruments taken as substitutes for the book will in fact become the new book. The most powerful works for the diffusion of human thought. This will be the radiated library and the televised book. Okay, so that was 1934. So, pretty good, right? So. Why has nobody heard of this guy? Well, um, Paul Atlay, as I mentioned, was working in Belgium. We all know what happened in Belgium a few years later. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of his work was lost. Uh, the Nazis actually uh, destroyed a lot of his work, and um, he died during the war and was sort of subsequently forgotten for a long time. But I think a lot of his ideas are really prescient and point the way towards a lot of what eventually happened. And I think now, in hindsight, we're starting to recognize, you know, the, just um, you know, how tuned in he was to some of the, the longer-term trends that were, that were starting to take shape. So a few other folks worth mentioning, and these are more sort of people who are conventionally mentioned in the history of, of, the, of the web and the, the internet. Uh, Vannevar Bush, who invented the Memex, which uh, is kind of a foundational text for a lot of later computer science and hypertext work. And of course, Ted Nelson, uh, the, the guy who coined the term hypertext in the 1960s and uh, spent much of his career trying to build a, uh, an environment called Xanadu that Tim Berners-Lee is freely acknowledged is, was the sort of conceptual inspiration for the World Wide Web. And there are lots of other people I could mention here if I have more time, people like J.C.R. Licklider and uh, Douglas Engelbart, um, a lot of other folks. And, and I think interestingly, in the era leading up to the web, there was a lot of alternative, there were a lot of alternative hypotheses floating around about hypertext and what a networked environment might look like. And unfortunately, a lot of those ideas sort of ground to a halt when the web sort of took off and became the dominant thing. But, um, but it's worth actually looking back at some of those sort of discarded hypotheses. There's a lot of interesting ideas in there. But if there's one thing we can say about a lot of these earlier design hypotheses, you know, there's one thing that I think brings them together, which is the sense of utopianism, the sense of pointing towards you know, a new and better world, a world where information is free, where there are new forms of knowledge that can be expressed and new experiences in both the built environment and the sort of virtual environment that we could create around these things. And you know, when we think about the practice of design, especially digital design today, as much as I think we are going through this really interesting moment, um, 
you know, the reality is that, you know, we're, we're, we're living in sort of two modes of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of economic life right now. I think on the one hand, we're seeing the emergence of this vast digital commons that, you know, is being fueled by a lot of these tools of expression and open access to all these, um, uh, you know, vehicles for expressing ourselves. At the same time, in parallel with that, we're seeing the emergence of these, uh, you know, of these, this new technology economy that is also existing in a very sort of traditional capitalist mode. And so I think there's a lot of interesting tensions and things to explore there between the, you know, the growth of these, um, you know, these powerful new, uh, you know, technology companies with no disrespect to, you know, present company, um, and, you know, and this, you know, incredible flowering of expression that we're seeing, questions of like policy and ethics and legality and, um, and where this all might take us. And I think really underlying a lot of this is, you know, the fact that on the one hand you have this great digital commons, on the other hand you have like a really fundamentally um, uh, uh, economic system that privileges sort of financial outcomes at some level. And I think as we think about a lot of the possibilities of the work that we're doing, and there's nothing wrong with financial outcomes or making money, but I think when we see a lot of the, the sort of change and disruption that's happening right now, it seems like um, there are a few tensions coming into focus. One is sort of the, the growing value that people seem to place on experiences. And I think one way of thinking about this is that, you know, when we say the word capital, it's very easy just to go to financial capital as being the way we think about value and measuring, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the impact or the positive impact of the work we do. But, you know, we could look at reframing this a bit. Capital can mean different things. So it could mean experiences. And we're seeing this trend a lot, I think, in the consumer world where people are starting to, especially among millennials, this tendency to value experiences over products and thinking about what that means from a sort of experience design point of view. Um, we're also seeing, you know, the growing importance of social capital with like social networks and friend networks and these things becoming visible that, can, you know, that, that our relationships and our, the trust that we build in communities is also important. And at the same time, something that has often felt, um, I think a lot of the appeal of social networks comes from a sense that, you know, some of the underlying support systems that supported, you know, communities and social, and, you know, um, and, and older forms of social capital have been sort of disrupted. If anyone's ever read Bowling Alone, a great book about sort of the atomization of culture and the increasing sort of isolation of people. And as people have been drawn to technology, I think they've seen this, this kind of yearning for social connection sort of shape a lot of what we're doing. Um, certainly environmental or natural capital, you know, growing awareness of environmental impact and the, you know, trying to figure out how we measure the impact of the work that we're doing. A lot of interesting work going on in sort of the sustainable UX community around this kind of work. And maybe more aspirationally, um, thinking about spiritual capital. I think the, the sort of growth, the, the growing interest in sort of alternative uh, spiritual uh, uh, traditions, mindfulness, and these kinds of things sort of speak to a, a sense of people wanting to in integrate that into their lives. So these are just, I think, maybe some um, starting points for reflection, just thinking about how we frame the work we do and that there are ha having, you know, a, you know, an alternative framing that maybe uh, aspires to a more balanced view of the outcomes that we're presenting and maybe harkens back to some of these earlier sort of utopian ideas yeah. of what networked technologies could help us do might be just useful starting points for, for thinking about the work we're doing. So, so I'm over time, I'm gonna leave it here. I will uh, briefly plug my book about Paul Utley and I will say thank you. So, take care. All right. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Um, it's nothing like finding out all your innovation ideas are completely unoriginal, right? Um, but on the bright side, we're all samurai, so I guess we have that going for us. We are going to take a 20 minute break. There's going to be beer and pierogi. And you guys will be all like ready for the last half, the last section of our, our conference. So please go drink, eat, and come back. Okay, thanks. Hello, welcome back. Hope you all enjoyed the break. And welcome back to everyone watching the live stream. Our next conversation will explore the ways people can harness technology to help us solve problems. 
both pragmatic, both on a pragmatic and socially conscious level. Luis Fanon is the co-founder and CEO of Duolingo, the world's most popular language learning platform and most downloaded education app. He is an inventor of CAPTCHA and a current MacArthur Fellow. Demeji Onafua is an artist, designer, PhD researcher, and UX consultant. His research seeks to understand the impact of platforms on contributing to the new commons and exploring new approaches to UX. They will be joined on the stage by Google's Rich Fulcher, who leads the material design team and is based out of Mountain View, California. Please join me in welcoming Rich to the state and the panelists to the stage. Great, thank you both for coming today. Um, we're gonna do a couple of short presentations. Uh, Demeji and Louise have each prepared one, and uh, Demeji, you won the coin flip and elected to receive, <laughs> so you will go first. Great. Hi, everyone. So, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we'll start with that. So I, you know, I, I had to think about how to present to you guys today. And um, I decided to go for a, less, a much simpler approach. I want to walk you through a few points uh, from my research on design at, or designers as allies um, in fighting all forms of oppression, especially given um, our current um, climate. And, um, and also some work that I've drawn from my research on the commons as well. So I want to start here. Um, so I am Yoruba. That's my, um, my culture. Um, that's where I'm from. And I hope to use um, simple roles in my Yoruba culture and tradition to illustrate what designers must do uh, when they participate as allies. Um, and um, so I'll start here. Uh, first, I feel like an ally an upstream ally resides outside the boundary in question, uh, and they benefit from oppression. So they, however, commit to lending their privilege to be able to help others. Uh, so they need to cede power to be able to empower others to be able to. Um, recent developments in my home, home city of Portland, Oregon, and Charlottesville and other cities show the implications of extending privilege. In Portland particularly, you had a couple of upstream allies that stood up against a white supremacists um, and to help some, some Muslim girls. And uh, unfortunately, they lost their lives for it. So there are some implications to being an upstream ally. Um, another is the role of a scribe. Um, a scribe presents honest narratives uh, to the recent concerns of the oppressed. So when I think about scribes, I'm reminded by this African proverb. Um, until the lions have their historians, uh, the story of the hunt glorifies the hunter. So in other words, uh, scribes are in the essence uh, the lion's historians. They're the ones that show different narratives of a story. Here's an example here. Um, this is Equal Justice Initiative, um, co-sponsored by Google. Uh, we all know the effects of lynching in US history, or do we? Um, this platform tells the truth about providing new knowledge uh, to an existing issue, which is lynching, by, um, by providing data in a different way and confronting racial bias through, uh, through data. So the role of the scribe overlaps the role of what I call the oracular representative. In my culture, that's called a babalao. Uh, the oracle, um, I think, is what gives knowledge and the oracular representative uh, gives knowledge in ways that are blind to influence. Uh, so they ensure that knowledge is given without bias. Um, I did this work with uh, Dr. Joanna Bonhart and Bianca Elzenbama. Um, at, and we led a conversation at the Design Research Society in Brighton in the UK, and uh, also presented a paper last year at, in Malmo, Sweden, about uh, the topic of design and symbolic violence. Um, 
I see symbolic violence as a reproduction of the isms that we see in our culture, like racism, classism, sexism, and others. Um, so the concept of symbolic violence was um, introduced by Pierre Bourdieu, who is a sociologist, and, and he introduced that in 1979. And the research documented in his book highlighted how class, power, and social inequity are reproduced through taste regimes. And so, as in, um, in essence, symbolic violence leads to manipulation instead of an emancipation or erasure instead of presence in others. Uh, symbolic violence, what I believe is, um, is a result of what I call emotional carelessness. Uh, so, for example, let's look at this. This is the um, uh, Kodak Shirley cars in the uh, 50s through the 70s uh, used to cali calibrate skin tones. Um, in, in photo development, and I, I believe that it has a legacy of symbolic violence. Uh, and it begs the question, what exactly do we consider to be normal? You know, what is our, what is our take on what normalcy is? Um, and I, I, I believe also that symbolic violence can be seen in um, uh, machine learning and AI, um, AI especially in uh, machine learning algor algorithms uh, through algorithmic bias. Uh, as a design researcher um, and a proud spouse of a black female technologist um, in a heavily male-dominated um, industry, I know that overcoming this bias can be a challenge for, for this industry. So, you know, I, I, I had to, cons I thought about putting this up there. I was like, oh, you know, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> the New this was like last year's New York Times article. Um, that underlined uh, some of those biases in, in uh, machine learning um, that, uh, that are for intelligent systems. So for example, um, how could you forget this, like the Google's photo app issue with the misrepresentation of images of dark-skinned folks as, you know. Um, and Google since apologized and has rectified this. But, you know, we can see that some of our cultures cannot perpetuate these forms of violence. So finally, I want to share the role of a town crier. A town crier is what I think is a platform builder. Uh, the town crier creates a space for negotiation and for learning to occur, and they ensure that, the, um, that there is always the right forms of representation, so the right people are at the table. Um, this is a recent um, local, more localized example of platform and allyship um, through the role of a town crier. Uh, Conflict Kitchen, so John Rubin was here yesterday, and um, they shared some of the challenges that they had with um, um, some of the incredible platforming work they did. So, if we feel that allies are necessary, then we ask um, ourselves if um, allying is indeed a natural predisposition. And Contrary to social Darwinists, um, evolutional biology is the definition of selfish. is anything that uh, perpetuates not the individual gene, but the collective gene. So there's a collectivism that is in, in, inherent in, in our, our desire to survive as a, as a, as a group. Um, according to Yohai Benkler, um, we perform selfish acts because we are emotional beings more than rational ones. So we care when we're incentivized to. And I believe that there's no greater incentive um, than our collective well-being and our collective survival. So what must we do as designers that, that want to be allies? Um, once again, we have to work as activists and advocates and, and fight all forms of oppression by doing these things that I shared. One, we have to lend privilege uh, to others. Secondly, we have to provide honest and true narratives. Uh, thirdly, uh, we have to give knowledge with no bias or as little bias as possible. And fourthly, we have to build the platforms that empower others. And um, thank you. Uh, most importantly, I think we have to refuse to stay silent. So we have to always speak up. Thank you, guys. Hi. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Luis. I'm Luis. I'm the CEO of Duolingo. And I guess I, I decided to spend my 
time telling you a little about Duolingo. Um, so I started working, it's the thing I've been working on for about the last six years or so. Um, and I started working on Duolingo because um, I, I was in a pretty fortunate position. I had sold my second company to Google. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, was, I, I decided that I wanted to um, work on something that was really my passion, which is, which is education. Um, now, my views on education are very related to where I'm from. I am from Guatemala. Uh, this is a public service announcement, by the way. That is where Guatemala <laughs> is. And this is very important. That is not where they keep the prisoners. That's called Guantanamo. <laughs> very different. Um, now, Guatemala is a very poor country, and a lot of people talk about education as something that brings equality to different social classes. Um, uh, but I always saw it as the opposite, as something that brings inequality, because what happens is um, people who have a lot of money can buy themselves the best education in the world, and because of that, they continue having a lot of money, uh, whereas people who don't have a lot of money uh, barely learn how to read and write, especially in a poor country like Guatemala, and because of that, they never are able to make a lot of money. Uh, so I wanted to do something that would give equal access to education to everybody, regardless of their socioeconomic condition. Now, education is very general, uh, so I wanted to do something, so, you know, education is very general, so I decided to do just one type of education, uh, which is something really huge everywhere in the world, except in the United States, it's not as big, which is learning a foreign language. So it <laughs> turns out there's 1.2 billion people in the world learning a foreign language. Yeah. Now, uh, this is a pretty interesting market. Um, the vast majority of these people, two-thirds of them, satisfy three properties. First, they're learning English. Second, the reason they're learning English is in order to get a, a job or a better job. And third, uh, they are of low socioeconomic condition. Okay, so most people that are learning a foreign language are doing so, are basically learning English to get out of poverty. At the same time, most of the ways there were to learn a language before Duolingo were very expensive. So, for example, in the US, there's this thing called Rosetta Stone. Uh, rest in peace. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Basically, <laughs> them. Uh, it's, it's about $1,000 to buy Rosetta Stone. So it's this crazy thing that if you know, if you're trying to get out of poverty, it seems like it costs about $1,000 to get out of poverty. So it's this crazy thing that's just ironic. So about you know, five years ago, uh, we finally launched uh, this thing called Duolingo, which at first it was a website. Uh, then at some point, uh, we decided that it would be good to make a, a companion mobile app. This is kind of what we thought at the time. but. Turns out, you know, by now about 90% of our traffic is on mobile. Um, so we're, you know, we're By the way, speaking of design, all of the design team of Duolingo is here, scattered, uh, and including, yeah, <laughs> uh, they're here. Um, and so now the thing about Duolingo, so by now it is it's the most popular way to learn languages in the world. Um, there's a lot of really staggering numbers. So for example, there are more people in the United States learning languages on Duolingo than there are people learning languages in the whole U.S. public school system. Uh, or, you know, we teach all kinds of languages. We teach, you know, the most learned language is English, but we teach all kinds of languages. For example, we, we teach Irish, which I'll be honest, I didn't actually know Irish was a language. I thought they spoke English in Ireland, but it turns out they, they also speak Irish. Uh, and there's, there's 94,000 native speakers of Irish. And on Duolingo, we have about a couple of million people actually learning Irish. So, so we have the chance of multiplying the number of Irish speakers by 10. By the way, on St. Patrick's Day, the number of Irish learners on Duolingo significantly increases. <laughs> um, now, so it, it's become very popular, and, and you know, I'll tell you some of the things why it's popular. So here are some of the things that people have said. So for example, this person said, in the past two days, they've learned more from Duolingo than in four years of high school. Now, I work at Duolingo. Duolingo's not that good. Uh, so that basically probably speaks more about how crappy high schools are teaching you languages. Um, or there is this other person. Um, that was my mother. <laughs> she really thinks that. Now, but really the main reason, and, and I can say that here, and this is, this is not just because of the design team here is here, but really I think the main reason why Duolingo has really stood out uh, is because we have really, really good design. And so, you know, one of the things is when, when, we, were, when we were deciding to do Duolingo, we realized one of the hardest things to do about learning a language and actually learning anything by yourself is staying motivated. That's really, you know, it, learning a language is a lot, or learning anything by yourself is like, a lot like going to the gym. Everybody wants to do it, but when it comes time to it, it's very easy to give up. So what we decided to do is we, we decided to make Duolingo feel as much like a game as possible. Uh, so we spend a lot of time designing it. So this is basically some design elements that we use in Duolingo. This is what our um, home screen on Duolingo looks like now. There's a lot of really little game elements that you use. So for example, statistics at the top. Etc. This is what our lessons look like. So 
our lessons on Duolingo are not like reading a lot of grammar or anything. It's basically little exercises that you have to do in order to, you know, in order to advance. And everything you can either get right or wrong. Whenever you get right, uh, things right, you get points, etc. So it's, it's very gamified. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's kind of just what I wanted to tell you. I don't want to take too much time. I just want to show this one last thing, which is this is a map. We have used this everywhere in the world. This is a map of the most commonly learned language in every country in the world. Uh, as you can tell, English is the, the main one. In most countries, that's the most commonly learned language. In the United States, it's Spanish. In Canada, it's French. And you know, a lot of them make sense. But there's one that's really weird here, um, which is if you see in Sweden, the most commonly learned language is Swedish. <laughs> it's a little weird. Uh, at first, we thought this was a mistake. But then we actually checked the data. It turns out, really, in Sweden, most commonly learned language is Swedish. Um, but we actually, uh, you know, we went and dug further, and we realized it turns out that a lot of these people on Duolingo you have to say what your native language is, and it turns out a lot of these people are actually native Arabic speakers that are learning Swedish, and these are basically refugees. And then we started realizing that in in a lot of places in Europe there are a lot of native Arabic speakers learning the local language on Duolingo. So we feel pretty proud about that. Uh, so that's that's it. That's all I kind of wanted to say about Duolingo. So thank you. Great. Thank you. And I'll, I'll keep this. So thank you both for the presentations. Um, we put you on this discussion together because um, I think we've pretty clearly seen that you're both approaching through your work this idea of, of the collective good, um, both from the perspective of design as well as technology. Um, you know, Luis, you, uh, I think, take a little bit the view of the world as uh, this vast biological CPU with uh, unused cycles that we should uh, reclaim. Uh, and Debeji, I know that in your work, um, you've done a lot of work as to how design and UX can facilitate bringing people together, mm -hmm. uh, how it can kind of reinvigorate community. Um, I'll start with you, Dimeshi. Um, I know you identify as a social designer. Mm -hmm. What does that label mean to you, or what are the kind of characteristics that go into that? So, um, paraphrasing someone else's um, term, I feel that a social designer allows us um, to use design to understand how we live together in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, how do we build relationships? How do we build borders and boundaries that keep others in? Uh, sorry, other, that keep others out and keep some people in? Um, what, what kind of porosity levels do those boundaries need to have? How uh, do they need to be permeable? Do they need to be hard boundaries? Um, so just the way we engage and negotiate with each other, I think it's what social design is all about, and design's, um, design's role or impact in that process. Great. Yeah. Luis, uh, you, I don't know if you would self-identify as a designer. Is that I, I most definitely would not, and my design <laughs> team will, tell you, will be the first to tell you I'm yeah. not. <laughs> Nonetheless, I look at your work and I see aspects of what like, I would consider systems design. Yeah. yeah. Um, where do ideas start for you? Do you start from kind of the looking at individual needs or um, more commonly from looking at like larger inefficiencies uh, in, in, in systems or scale? Both. Um, I started my career as looking at, you know, there's always when you're coming up with a, when you're coming up with something, you can, there's, there's two ways you can do it. First, you can come up with a technology and then find a, find something that that technology solves, or then you can come up with a problem and then find a, a solution you know, through technology. I started by coming up with technologies and then figuring out what problems it solved. That's how you know, this original, um, I guess, whoever introduced me, Amber, I think, said that, um, that, that I also helped invent this thing called a CAPTCHA, which were these distorted characters. That was a little bit of a technology finding a solution. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in the case of, uh, of Duolingo, it was way more of a start with a problem and then try to, try to solve it. I think for both of you, like, there's a, a presence of community in the work. Uh, they might take slightly different flavors. I think, Debeji, maybe you focus a little bit more on kind of ongoing, sustainable communities, kind of building uh, how design can help build social structures that have uh, a more enduring impact on the, the people that are involved in them. Um, yours feel a little bit more transactional uh, or maybe ephemeral uh, in some ways. Um, I guess for both of you, and we'll start here, um, given that the community is at the focus, um, how do you reinforce kind of the individual's role, the importance of their commitment uh, to that community? That's, that's very important. That's a good question. Um, I feel that 
it's all transactional, right? So we have um, not only um, um, so social transactions happen even within you know when you think within communities that are not monetary based otherwise. So um, and to be able to identify how people negotiate those roles are very important. But um, you know a lot of my work is based on commons literature, where individual selfish needs. Um, are subserv subservient to the collective good. So, so not that um, the individual cannot fulfill their needs selfishly, but those needs have to be within the overall collective, collective good. And I feel that you know, there's a lot of evidence that shows that that's how we are wired. We want to help. Mm -hmm. you know? We want to help, um, and, if, you know, and this is where I think some of my work overlaps with uh, some of what um, Louis has done in the past is if you can incentivize people to help, they will help. But then the question then goes further uh, to ask, what are you incentivizing them to help uh, do? And um, I feel that um, if, if our collective livelihood is at stake, then that's a greater incentive. Then everybody wants, should be able to want to help. You know, if you know that these are things that we all need to survive, then everyone should participate. Do you have thoughts on uh, can individual motivations and how those are important to preserve? Yeah, I mean, we're, uh, so let's see. Um, I, I think throughout my career that, that has changed quite a bit. Um, the, the project that I was working on before Duolingo was this thing called reCAPTCHA, which is, um, it's, so the standard CAPTCHA is these distorted letters that you have to type all over the internet when you're, when you're buying tickets on Ticketmaster or whatever. Um, that was, I helped invent that in the year 2000, um, but later, in like 2006, um, I, uh, I did a little back of the envelope calculation that, that, you know, I figured out that about 200 million captures were typed every day by people around the world. Um, and at first I, I was quite proud of myself, I thought, look at the, look at the impact that I've had. Uh, but then it turns out most everybody hates typing these captures, uh, <laughs> and uh, it takes about 10 seconds of your time to do that, and if you multiply 10 seconds by 200 million, you get that humanity as a whole is wasting like 500,000 hours because of me. Uh, so, so I started feeling bad, uh, and then I st that's where this reCAPTCHA project came from, which is the idea was that as you're typing a CAPTCHA, uh, you know, the main reason why that's there is this is a security thing to prove that you're a human, but could we get something else out of it? And this is where uh, the idea came that while people were typing a CAPTCHA, they could also be helping us to digitize books. Mm -hmm. So there's this, um, you know, basically we built this whole process where the idea is that you start with a book, um, a digital, you know, sorry, a physical book, then to digitize it, the first thing you do is you take a digital photograph of every page of it, then the computer needs to be able to decipher all of the words in, in this picture, but um, for older books, the computer could not recognize many of them many of the words, so what we started doing is started taking these words and sending them to people as they were typing CAPTCHA, so the, the CAPTCHA that you would type is, was actually a word that was coming out of a book that the computer could not recognize, and we were using what you entered um, to, to digitize books. This, this turned out to be very successful, but there, you know, really, we, it was very transactional. This was, had essentially no meaning. I mean, people's contributions were just <laughs> like, I just want my Ticketmaster tickets. Here, I'll help you digitize <laughs> stuff. Um, we've changed it a lot in the case of for example, for crowdsourcing on Duolingo now, um, we do use crowdsourcing quite a bit, but the main way in which we use crowdsourcing on Duolingo is actually the courses that people take. For example, the Swedish course or the Irish course, those are all done by volunteers. We don't pay them, they're, they're completely done by volunteers, and, and they do it because, because they believe in Duolingo's mission, which is kind of giving free education to the world. Uh, and there, I think they really do get quite a bit of meaning from things. But, it's a very different, I mean, the contribution that there was to, to digitizing books on reCAPTCHA was 10 seconds. Here, these people that are contributing are, are spending, I don't know, 20 hours a week for <laughs> a year, uh, which is an amazing thing. So, I think maybe an interesting question is, how do you gauge, given that you're both kind of targeting like real world social impact in some of the work that you do? Um, it's not the user did a task, check the button, move on. How do you, how do you kind of gauge success? Like, what are the types of signals that you look for to tell you that the work you're doing is on the right course, that it's kind of helping either the community or it's helping at a larger scale? Uh, Louise, would you start? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, how to define success. I mean, we, uh, well, with Duolingo, we, you know, there's three things. We want to reach as many users as possible. Uh, that's one thing that, that we really care about. We also want to teach them. 
like actually teach them. It's very easy. You know, you could reach a lot of users by just making a game that doesn't do anything. Right. Um, so, and you know, it turns out it's actually quite hard to measure whether you're really teaching. Uh, so we spend a lot of effort on that. Um, so I, I think with us, you know, these are these are things that we use to define success. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, the other thing that, and we're not yet quite succeeding on that, uh, is we need to we need to actually pay for the whole operation. We're still we're still a money losing operation, but but soon we're we're on it. How do you <laughs> we're on it? <laughs> How do you measure like for the language um, fluency or success there? Like. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, we, the, the main way, it, we've, we've been at this for years trying to measure um, uh, how well people are learning. Originally, we had, a, we had a way to measure, which was, it worked, but it's super slow. Basically, it's this pre and post test thing, where like, basically, when somebody signs up to Duolingo, you send them an email to a small fraction of them. You would mm -hmm. say, hey, uh, we want to keep track of you while you're learning on Duolingo. Can, we, can you be one of these people that we keep track of, kind of like the Nielsen survey type people? Right. Uh, a small, uh, we would send this to a small fraction of people. A very small fraction would say yes. Then we'd say, great, can you take this test for us? It only takes four hours. Just take the <laughs> test. And they would take the test. You know, a tiny fraction of them would take the test. And then over time, we, they would use Duolingo, and we would, every now and then, would be like, hey, you want to take another four-hour test for us? Um, that was one way. It was very slow. It, it, it kind of worked. It showed that people were actually learning, but it didn't allow us to make decisions based on that. Now what we do is... Um, to all our users, every now and then, um, they just get a screen on the app that is basically a, um, a, a little test uh, that is on the app. It takes, it, it takes like a couple of minutes, and we just give them at random to different people, and then we're, we're, we're able to see how well people are learning, and we're even able to run A-B tests on this. We're able, even able to say, like, hey, uh, if, for example, we start making Duolingo a lot harder, um, do, do people, are people actually learning more or not? Mm -hmm. And we're, we're able to measure that. So in terms of my work, and I'm going to get in a soapbox for just a little bit, um, some of the challenges that we're facing in this world, um, you cannot use the um, traditional me metrics of measurement of success to be able to understand them. They're just too complex. And, um, and so, you, for example, you think about issues like housing, and, um, you know, um, a lot of people... Um, are un unable to afford housing, uh, being pushed out of their homes. You have issues of gentrification. You have um, you have h housing um, housing market in decline and those kinds of things. You know, some people have used terms like wicked problems because just the interconnectedness of these problems are so complex that once you attempt to solve a part of it, it causes more problems. So we have to be careful not to think of success in terms of metrics for these kinds of problems. So then the question now is then, what do we do? So then that, I think, changes the role of what a designer is. How does a designer engage with a problem? You know, how yeah, you have designers that engage as facilitators, that get people to actually come together to address the problems and then attempt to solve them, or at, at least attempt to solve a small part of them in a certain way. You have the designers that are embedded into the culture, and uh, I, I believe designers that are commoners, like everybody else, and actually participate in the process, so the designer as a participant, right? And then I think one of the ways that we see that the problems might be more effectively reframed is maybe a designer as an amplifier. So there are some people that work in the space of looking for good patterns of things that are going well mm -hmm. and then amplifying them so that people can do more of those good things. So um, I, I think, uh, unfortunately, I think the kinds of, the kinds of things I'm looking at, I'm, unfortunately, they're not things that can be you know, measured in the traditional sense. Right, mm -hmm. you know, but I, but I think you can see if I, I guess you could say that if we're all, um, so because we're in the age of the Anthropocene, so the things that we're doing are causing, uh, we're now actually beginning to see the effects of human action in our world, right? So I guess if we all don't die, then that's a success, <laughs> right? <laughs> You know, I hate to be, glib, you know, to be gloomy and glib about this, but you know, maybe that's it. If we can survive, <laughs> then we have been successful. <laughs> I'd love to follow up on kind of that, that yes. role of, well, the future of the world. No. Yes. Uh, the, like that embedded designer yes. and that idea. Um, 
when a designer kind of fosters that depth of relationship with yes. that community, and in many cases becomes part of it, yes, as through the act of, of, of working in that space, yes. can they just walk away? Uh, that, yeah. Does it change what what being done or kind of what their longer term connection is? Yes, it does. And you know, we, you know, designers have traditionally walked away, right? You know, like someone once told me, they, you know, look at that chair. The person that designed that chair is not here anymore. He's gone, or she is gone somewhere else designing another chair, right? So we're used to walking away, but now we have to start learning, um, at least understanding the consequences of what we do. And it requires a different level of engagement, right? So I work in, with a community in, in Portland, Oregon, of uh, tenants, uh, tenant activists, right? And I have to be able to embed myself and work closely with them to start to wrap my arms around the tenancy issue that Portland is facing, thanks to you Californians that are moving there. <laughs> but and, uh, by the same time, I have to let them understand that I am a researcher. So I am actually I'm working in a certain type of role or position. And, but then you have, uh, so these are big questions we have to ask ourselves. Um, so at uh, Carnegie Mellon, there's a transition design program. So designing for long-term future skills, right? So how can a designer be engaged with a problem with a full-term commitment, knowing that they might not be the ones to solve the problem? Right. It takes a different level of humility, you know? And, you know, humility is not a trait we tend to associate with designers, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we have to start thinking, rethinking who we are and how we, how we work as, yeah. as, um, as a discipline. And I think, it's, um, I think it's exciting times for designers, you know? Um, you know, the designer as a gardener, you know, tending to the garden, not so much changing things. Uh, Luis, even for a product like Duolingo, you have very different user motivations for why they come to the product. You, you talked uh, earlier about, you know, that desire for personal advancement, maybe, you know, just kind of uh, quality of living, you know, to learn another language. Somebody else may be doing it for just getting closer to a friend or a relation. Somebody might just be doing it for, for kicks, the let's learn Irish on St. Patrick's Day use case. How do you kind of balance those very disparate kind of user goals for this common service you're offering? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really excellent question. I, you know, I don't know if we have a great answer. I mean, we, we do know, we don't know uh, the, the there's a few big chunks of uses that we have. There's the ones that are basically trying to learn English to further their, themselves. That's kind of one big group. There's, so they actually want to learn a language. There's the ones that are being forced to learn a language. So people, kids in school, I, you know, I, I don't think they actually want to learn a language all that much, but they're there and they're kind of, all right, fine, I got to do it. Um, and then there's the ones, like you said, and this is actually a surprisingly large number of, of, um, of our users, particularly in countries like the US. They are not all that interested in learning a language. They're, they're more like, well, you know, I was playing Candy Crush, uh, but <laughs> uh, I'll use Duolingo. It's not quite as fun as Candy Crush, but it's still kind of fun, and at least I don't, at least I'm not wasting my time entirely. Uh, and I think that that's, that's, that's actually a large chunk of our users in, 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 in developed countries, at least. Um, and so it's, it's very hard. I mean, ultimately, I do think that all of them need to be motivated. I mean, even the ones that are, even the ones that, that really want to further their lives, et cetera, you know, People are lazy, generally, uh, so I think even they need to be motivated. So ultimately, I think we tr even though they're very different, we kind of treat them the same. Um, I don't know if this is what we should be doing. We've never experimented with having multiple apps for different people. That seems like uh, messy, so we haven't done it. But yeah, we, we think about all of these different user groups. Um, I know in, in your work on capture and recapture, um, it's interesting to me because I think one of the things that designers sometimes struggle with, and, and you talked about this in your presentation, is that, that defining of normal and that like, there is a kind of stereotypical assessment of the user that you have to kind of check your biases about. You want to expand that meaning out and get closer and closer. You kind of effectively approached it from an opposite angle, which is, well, I'm trying to define a human based on how they are not a robot or they are not a machine. Um, did you still run into issues around kind of inclusiveness or accessibility? In yeah, that? yeah, a lot. I mean, with recaption in particular, you know, this is a visual test. If you can't see, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, according to the original CAPTCHA, if you can't see, you're a robot. That's not a great thing. So then we added the audio CAPTCHA, but then there are people who, uh, who actually use the internet who are both deaf and blind. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, we ended up having no solution for that. That was basically like, if you can't do either one of these, here's a phone number you can call to you know, get your tickets, uh, which was pretty terrible. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, I think there's, there's a lot of that. I mean, we run into that on Duolingo too. I mean, all kinds of accessibility issues with Duolingo. Um, we, best effort is what we do. Yeah. Um, Timeshi, when you think about community, um, how important is the idea of, of, of a shared self-identity uh, mm. to that development of it? Mm. You know, I think it's, uh, I guess it's fundamental to what a community is, but the question is how do you, I guess, how do you share that identity? Um, so I, to when I think about communities, I don't think in terms of essentially as place-based um, group of people based on, um, you know, I, you know um, what they identify with or, or not. Um, I'm also in terms of like the spaces that occupy the, the place, right? What are, how do they negotiate with each other? What are the, what the, what are the, um, what are the modes of, um, you know, how how do they, how do they solve problems together? I, I, you know, I think about s smaller scale. You know, in my research, I work with smaller scale communities that I would call collectives. So people that are actually that are grouping around um, a core issue and uh, with the desire to solve that issue. Um, and I think those collectives could reside just about anywhere. The question is how, you know, how might they negotiate the spaces between, you know? I'm not sure of that. Yes, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, the last few decades, globally, we've yeah. seen an erosion in faith in institutions. Yeah. Um, I think it's kind of very pronounced in, in our mindset right now, but it's something that's been happening over time. Um, technology gives us the ability to kind of design our own lives to some degree. Uh, we don't have to follow the collective wisdom about media or medicine or lots of kind of smaller choices. Um, do either of you, a uh, question for either, do you see in design or in technology any, any glimmers of, of hope for kind of reinvigorating and perhaps kind of re-engineering those institutions to help them better serve uh, the populations they're built for? <laughs> if you could figure that out, <laughs> please come and help my country because our yeah. government sucks. <laughs> no is an answer. Did, 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 ditto to that. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Blame that one on the moderator. Um, Lisa, I'll look at your work and I, I can't help but see the theme of, of, of frustration with inefficiency. It seems like it's something that's kind of followed you uh, through time. Um, do you feel that in your personal life as well? It, what is it like to kind of walk around in the day? Can you, can you bear to see things that are uh, inefficient? I'm a very frustrated person. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I really don't like inefficiency. Um, I, I, I don't. Um, I see it every day in every aspect of life. Um, it, it has, it's a very humbling experience. You know, I, I, I was at Google for a few years, and, and it was um, such a large company. And it, it's so easy when, when you're just an employee to see, like, ah, this could be done better. Ah, this could be done better. Now that, you know, uh, a lot of things are basically ultimately up to me in, because I'm the CEO of this company, which is much smaller than Google. But still, uh, it, is, it is amazing how inefficient most everything in the company is. And then I sit there thinking, boy, that's really, I could fix that if I, if I wanted to, but I don't know how to. Um, so it is very frustrating, um, and, and now I have a significantly higher respect for all these large companies that operate so well. I don't know how the hell I don't know how the hell Google operates so well. I, uh, I, I have much higher respect for that now. Dimesha, you started your career in a more kind of traditional advertising background when it came to design. <laughs> Uh, were there things you had to kind of... That was my secret. That was my little secret. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Advertising. <laughs> <It's pretty evil. laughs> oh, You're here man. now. It's a very safe space. It's an embracing crowd. Awesome. Good. <laughs> were there things you need to, needed to kind of unlearn uh, in the process of that as you changed your design focus? <laughs> um, yes. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, advertising is... Um, uh, you know, you know, and I'm trying to choose my words carefully, but the goal of advertising is to sell a product, essentially, or to build a brand. Um, and design is, um, is a, it's a unique way of seeing problems 
I think designers are hired because they have a special skill of understanding um, uh, problems in, um, you know, we talk about the designer's reasoning as abductive, right? It's not linear, it's not inductive or deductive, like scientific reasoning, right? So we make guesses, we make calculated guesses. Advertising, um, we know the end goal, you know, we're trying to sell something, we're trying to increase market share, and the question is how do we get there? So, yes, there was a lot of unlearning, and not only did I do advertising, I actually went into business, I actually got a business degree as well. <laughs> so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of learning, of uh, unlearning of how, you know, how to uh, um, understand problems outside of the dominant economic paradigm we find ourselves in. You know, there are other ways to um, live in, in communities than what we have in front of us. And that might have existed before us. You know, then how might we bring back those ways of thinking and those modes of living into understanding how we live our daily lives? And I think I've, yeah, I've, I've had to, you know, go back a little bit in, you know, some of those things and, you know, unlearn some, you know, I shouldn't be saying this publicly because all my advertising <laughs> instructors in high school and college, and you know, they're probably listening. So. That's okay. You're up here. They're not. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> um, Luis, you were born in Guatemala. Uh, Demetri, you were born in Nigeria. Yes. Uh, full disclosure, I was born in New Jersey. <laughs> um, how has that, it, has that influenced your work in your career? Is there still, a, you've, you've been in the States for quite a while now. Uh, do you still carry that with you? Does it still kind of change things on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm. Yes. Um, you know, I, you know I, and I also usually particularly think of myself as a Yoruba first, mm -hmm. and a Nigerian second, and an American third. I, you know, I, I say that I carry my American passport only when it's convenient. <laughs> so, so it's, um, yeah, it informs my everyday life. But then also beyond that, in, you know, living in America, I'm also very keenly aware of my blackness, you know, so that, that actually has taken, a, um, uh, it's been more at the forefront of who I am and uh, my identity than being a Nigerian because I am seen as a black person first. And so, yes, um, and so it's a daily negotiation, you know, one of the things that I, I'm not sure if you have this experience, but when I go back home, uh, which I consider Nigeria to still be home, people ask me where I'm from, <laughs> you know, so I have to wrestle with that identity of, yeah. you know, exactly who, you know, who you are. But it's, um, it informs my work, my culture informs my work, I draw a lot from um, my cultural background, my origins, my traditions, and, and those kinds of things, so it's very fundamental to who I am. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, I, it informs a lot of things. I mean, all of, all of Duolingo is probably, a lot of it comes from the fact that I had to learn English when I was growing up, and I saw how, how big of a, of, of a difference it made for people who know English. I mean, this is one of, knowledge of English is this crazy thing. People, I guess people in the U.S. who've lived their whole lives in the U.S. just don't understand this, that, that in non-English speaking countries, knowledge of English can increase your, your earning potential by, by somewhere between 25 and 100 percent. I mean, it's just this crazy thing, so yeah. Being from Guatemala really influences me. Um, it's Guatemalan food is a lot like Mexican food. Um, so on, on, at Duolingo, we have Mexican Mondays. We also have Taco Tuesdays. <laughs> we have Guacamole Wednesdays. <laughs> we ran out on Thursdays. We don't have anything. But yeah, we eat, we eat Mexican food. <laughs> uh, I think for the last question for both of you today, um, you know, the work that we do is hard. There are plenty of obstacles in it. Um, is there a moment that, you can, that you'd be willing to share with us that you come back to as a, like a point of pride, like a moment in the course of your career, something you've done, uh, a memory that you kind of hold on to, to to help give you the energy when things are, are tough? Um, the first time that I saw that something in, at Duolingo happened without me even being aware of it, and it was awesome, I was very proud of that. Yeah. I was like, I did not have anything to do with that. That was awesome. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I think for me, it's the decision to... Um, so I owned um, a design studio in North Carolina for almost a decade, and I, 
I saw what was being done in, in the African continent in the way of social innovation, and I felt like that needed to change. And for that to change, I need to go deeper in my study of what design is and be a little bit more critical about design. And at that moment, I, I made a decision to go back for a PhD. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you can tell because I look young, but I'm not a, tra you know, I'm not a traditional PhD student. So I think that decision is, um, has been a very useful one for me. And I always go back to that decision because it's gotten me to see a, a broader view of design and what design can be. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you both for joining us for the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Oh, no. Oh, I think I'm okay. What? What? Okay. Thank you, Rich, Demeji, and Luis. Um, that was great. So we have two speakers left tonight. Um, and actually, I think it was an excellent segue because we can think about like advertising. You know, we were talking about advertising in the last panel, but like, what does it mean when a punk starts an advertising agency? Um, and actually, Nathan, I want to ask you because I feel like I feel like punk is a misnomer, and we had some like conversation about this in the office. Is it more hardcore? Yes, yes. Okay, Nathan Mart, is it mathcore? That was other it, like. <laughs> Okay, our next speaker is Nathan Martin. He's a globally recognized advertising leader and the founder and CEO of Deep Local, an innovation studio working for some of the world's most celebrated brands, including making an awesome installation for us, Netflix, Spotify, Nike. Welcome, Nathan, to the stage. Math core, that's too tough for me. All right, can you guys hear me all right? Okay, good. Um, Man, advertising just got totally dissed too, so now I have to talk about advertising. Um, Let's we'll start here. So what I'm gonna actually talk about uh, is rapid invention. How do we build stuff really fast? I'm an impatient person. Uh, my background is uh, all over the place. I studied fine art. Uh, I have electronic uh, media arts degrees and MFA. I uh, spun off a company about 11 years ago from Carnegie Mellon called Deep Local, um, and I'll talk about that. Uh, but my background is fine art, not advertising. Um, I didn't go to school for any of this stuff or business. So for about 10 years, I ran a, uh, a band called Creationist Crucifixion, which was a hardcore, punk, mathcore, whatever you want to call it, band. Uh, traveled, uh, toured as many places as I could, uh, and I learned a lot from doing that. The precursor for that started when I was in six, 16 years old in high school is when I first started touring. Uh, I also started a um, collaborative art group called the Carbon Defense League, which was more like kind of a, a hacktivist, uh, activist media art group. Um, oftentimes with the band, I would collapse those together. So when we'd play shows, we'd also teach people reverse engineering workshops, uh, how to turn disposable cameras into projectors, um, how to reverse engineer cell phones, create cell phone jammers. It was really a, a technology-driven punk band in a scene that was in that era very, very Luddite. Um, so talking about technology, talking about subversion of technology, reclamation of it, and actually also very, very critical of advertising. So it's, and the surface, very strange as I end up where I am right now. So for the last 11 years of my life, I run Deep Local. Um, I was started with three people, uh, two of which left and, and are still in the design world, uh, and myself. Um, prior to that, I was a researcher at Carnegie Mellon at the Studio of Creative Inquiry for about three years. Uh, so this seems very disparate, but I'm going to tell you about some of the work that we do, why we do it, uh, why we are a very unique company, even though we're into this guise of advertising, what we're doing is, I, I believe, quite different. Um, we've built a reputation for that, but both have the same ethos behind them. We really believe in, and I really believe in questioning authority, questioning conventional wisdom. I hate when someone tells me that's the way things are done or how they're supposed to be. I don't believe in disciplines or labels. I don't care what someone went to school for. Uh, I'm going to expect the most of everyone I work with every day, and I want to work with people that want to solve problems and create things that disrupt the world, that get noticed, and we can take credit for. That's what I care about. And right now, we have this opportunity to do that in advertising, which is not actually what I set out to do. We founded our company as a product company. Uh, we built a whole series of products. We raised money, did everything that you would do as a product company. Also didn't know what I was doing uh, at that stage either. Kind of learned as I went. We evolved into becoming a consultancy, working as kind of like a design engineering firm. And then we evolved back into uh, something that is, is resembles an advertising agency. My background and my artwork was often in the space of kind of interactive experiences, interactive installations, electronic media. So uh, I was a self-taught software engineer, electrical engineer, uh, things of that type. 
So deep local, what the hell is it? Uh, we call ourselves an innovation studio. Innovation is a totally generic, bore, uh, boring word. Uh, we use that for a reason because it's difficult to describe what we do, um, but we do need to find clients and customers who are often tasked with creating innovative solutions. We have an integrated process. We do not look like many other companies. So our staff is about 60 people. Uh, about half that staff come from engineering uh, backgrounds, so you'll see people um, from electrical engineering, heart, uh, software, robotics, aerospace engineering, industrial design, sitting alongside people with strategy, marketing, uh, graphic design backgrounds. All of those people work and play nice in a very small uh, open office environment and collaborate regularly on projects of which we, we run five to ten simultaneously. Um, so in advertising, when we work with a client, we're often working with CMOs. We're tasked, just like advertising agencies are, with creative challenges, briefs. How do you tell a story and make Netflix innovative to a global audience? And then we respond with creative ideas. The difference is we make all of our ideas ourselves. We believe in building things out, having total creative control of every step of the process. Um, but we also develop the launch strategy, why we're going to get people to talk about it, why they're going to care. And then we, we make decisions that are based on very simple rules that we've learned along the way. I used to make creatives call my dad because I learned after a couple of years that my father was better at judging whether our ideas were going to be successful or not uh, than our, our clients or my peers were because my dad uh, understood that if, if he couldn't grasp what we had just built or designed in about uh, you know, 10 seconds, no one else is going to either. So we have these rules of thumb. If I can show you something and you can find the words on your own to describe what you just saw, then social media works for us and I don't have to over-engineer it. If I can create something that's simple enough, and this is very different than art, that on the surface, that surface is, is essentially a, a one-line concept, and I'll show you some of this work, socks that pause your TV when you fall asleep, then the press will pick it up and that story will ripple. Um, so we've had a lot of success with that work that we do. Why we do innovation at all is I believe that most businesses, most of our clients, and, and Google is one of our largest clients, but we also work with you know, Netflix, Lyft, Spotify, Airbnb. These are companies that all, even if they per are perceived as innovative, need to innovate. What do I mean by that? I mean that every business out there needs to be doing something different next year than they're doing this year, of any size. That can be a coffee shop down the street because you're cool for a year and you're not cool next year. You constantly need to evolve what you are, and that's true of my own business as well. I'm introspective about that. Uh, and why, why this is true right now and challenged probably more than ever is that you're seeing things like internal re uh, research and development has gone away or drastically gone stale. I'm a firm believer that amateurs are better at solving problems than experts. Uh, people that sit and try to develop what, you know, the next uh, version of, uh, I'll pick on Apple, um, Keynote is going to look like, we'll get very, very bored. And some of you may have worked for Apple. I've had designers that have. You will get bored after your three-year life cycle of trying to figure out that new feature. You can't wait to add to Keynote. Um, so R&D internally has gone stale. In-house product development, for the same reasons, take way too long. Businesses, for good reason, uh, have a lot of oversight, especially the larger you get, so that innovation takes a lot of time. Change. Think about it as this change takes a lot of time. Um, marketing and product development in most businesses are very disparate organizations. So the product side is not informed by the marketing side. As much as we might criticize advertising and marketing, what they know is what is culturally relevant right now. And that's what most brands need to figure out. What do people care about right now that's in the moment and relevant? That cannot inform a product that comes out three years down the road. It needs to inform a product that comes out right now. So there needs to be a collapse of those two, and most businesses fail to collide those two. Um, so marketing needs to be involved. Product design firms, and I apologize. I'm sure some of you work for them. I'm highly critical of them. I've never had success hiring anyone that's come from HCI or design research. It is too slow. Most of you will work on research decks and PDFs that no one will ever build. They will sit in a, in a space where your client and your business will sit on this, and for the most part, it will not get put into place because it takes too long, and the businesses are, chased with, are, are challenged with business challenges that have to be solved immediately, like next quarter. They're mostly quarterly businesses if they're publicly held. So the challenge is, how do you solve a problem that's two years out in a cycle that lasts a quarter? So you have to move faster, and, and most product design firms are struggling to keep up. Um, agencies, the advertising agency world is also a huge failure. Um, that's an industry where, for the most part, uh, they've gotten really good at figuring out where they can make money, which is on ideas that someone else makes. So putting the risk with what's called a production company. So you'll see that most of the industries and large agencies are divided where uh, the advertising agency comes up with the idea, someone else makes it. Um, ideally, that's, uh, that's someone where there's four or five of them so you can get the lowest bid. I'll explain that in a little bit. But they've subcontracted work, which makes uh, bad work, makes it slow as well, makes it inefficient and creates risk. What does that mean? So. Just if you're familiar with how an agency works, a typical advertising agency, a creative studio, a creative agency, 
they focus on this part of it. What's the idea? That's their silo. Um, they start with strategy, research, maybe they have a focus group and they figure out, here's the insight, here's the idea based on a brief. I want to make something. Uh, I want to send a, a man to the moon. Um, then they have to ask someone else, is it possible? Because those creatives have no idea about what's technically possible. So they have to go to someone else and rely on them outside of that agency, typically, and say, is it possible? Um, sometimes that's internal. Sometimes that's what's called a creative technologist, which is often a person that just has a web development background. But sometimes, sometimes there's people with more, uh, more expertise than that. And then they go to a third-party company, which is a production company. And for, for large businesses um, that are publicly traded, they, that requires triple bidding, which uh, in itself guarantees you are not making anything that's been innovative um, because it means you have three people that have to be able to do the same thing and a procurement department has to be able to evaluate them line by line next to each other and choose the lowest bidder in itself, meaning that whatever you're about to get is generic. Um, that's the let's make it company, a production company. That is a slow process. It creates risk because these two businesses, at best if there's two, have very different business goals. The advertising agency, which when it's working well, is focused on creating the best user experience, story, ad, whatever that might be, it is. And then the production company, whose goal is to reduce risk and make profit. Those are two different business interests that do not serve the, uh, the end audience, which is some person in the world that has to get excited about whatever you're making or putting out there. Uh, engineering shops are not much better. Um, so typical engineering firms, um, and I employ a lot of engineers, but typical engineering firms care a lot about what's the idea being solved by someone else. I don't want to deal with subjective shit. Tell me what the idea is and I will go design it. And then they have their own process. Is it possible is always a maybe. It's never going to be a yes. It's always going to be a maybe. And it's always going to go through this cycle of define, define the problem, design, uh, prototype, uh, iterate, redesign, build. That is also a slow cycle. The goal of that cycle, and, and for good reason, is about reducing risk. And that will get to the end decision, provided the person up front made the right idea, then you'll get to whatever that idea is, and, and, and that's all good. But that person better be pretty fucking smart about what they're designing. Um, so, I just went back. What does a hybrid advertising, or hy hybrid advertising and engineering firm look like? And that's what we're trying to create. We've spent, uh, we have an interesting model you know, starting as a product company ourselves. We initially went into advertising and worked as a production company under ad agencies. We learned from them. We learned all of their inefficiencies. We learned the things that we didn't need. We learned that the company doesn't need to be a thousand people. And we took the things that we liked and built that into our business model. Likewise for engineering, um, we were able to look at that as well and say, these are the things that are part of the process that are, are too long because we need to adapt it to marketing timelines, which are very, very short. Um, so we always have a, a definitive end date that we have to deliver on because often we're building work that's part of a larger campaign um, that involves more money than we might be getting. So at that point, like the engineering process needs to change because we need to deliver something. So what does that mean? That means what's the idea? Is it possible? And are you going to make it need to happen simultaneously? They happen all at once. And they happen because you have a team of people that have a certain set of skills that allows them to communicate regularly say, I have a pretty good idea what the idea is and some unknowns. I'm, I'm pretty confident we can make it, kind of. And I hit a problem along the way, we're going to figure it out and resolve it. And then when you combine a lot of different skills in one place that are able to tackle that problem, that allows you to solve the problem in a number of different ways. Any problem that you encounter along the way, the let's design it, it is a continual process. The idea will change and flow. It is ongoing. And it has to be informed along the way. And the only way that works is when you don't have minions who are divided up doing their task that come together at the end and say, oh, voila, here's our idea. Those people need to have uh, operate in flux. When there's a problem in software, hardware picks it up. And if not, then a human can do the part too. Always having those people kind of collaborate. That's important. And what that allows us to do is make stuff faster than anyone else out there. Um, this is a robot that prints messages on the roads of the Tour de France that we built in 2009 in about six weeks. Uh, this robot uses 48 spray nozzles. This was custom developed and then patented. Uh, users would send in messages over uh, Twitter or, um, or SMS text message or web page banner ads about cancer survival, RIP messages about lost loved ones. Those messages would go down to this robot that, that uh, operated at the Tour de France and every day uh, at 3 to 5 a.m. before the riders would be on the bike course, we would print these messages in real time. A camera would snap a photograph of the printed message, composite that into a JPEG that was then sent back to a user so they had a document. Why this existed, going back to the idea, was because there was a long 
history of people chalking messages on the roads of the Tour de France, something that people, you know, when they're there in person were able to do. Tour de France had a large following. It's covered overhead by helicopters. Nike had been a longtime sponsor, and this is before Lance Armstrong um, fell from grace. This was when we were still okay with him, uh, 2009. So at this time, Nike's typical presence, the Tour de France, was to sell yellow bracelets for a dollar and to have banners that had their logo on it. How do you take advantage of that opportunity? How do you create something that's more meaningful and impactful? And often, that really means creating something that people value, forgetting that it's an ad, making something that people want to make and using the dollars that that brand has to create an experience that's special, that they care about, regardless of that brand. The brand is attached to it. So for this, we allowed people to do something they couldn't do before, which is to participate remotely. We allowed them to create these mementos that they were able to take back and share. Then the, the campaign ran itself. Uh, people were printing t-shirts with personal messages to raise and selling them to raise funds for local cancer awareness charities. People sent in messages about their parents, their aunts, people struggling or battling to survive, and it was meaningful. And yes, it had value to the brand, but it was a meaningful thing first and foremost. Um, but to do this requires a team like I just described, where we designed this, engineered it, the hydraulics, the system, tested it in a place that used to be called Robot City over here in Hazelwood. Uh, it lives in, in a backyard, if you can find it right now, in Morningside, uh, and, and all in you know, six weeks. When we went to the Tour de France, we operated ourselves um, with six people. And, that, and that's what you have to do to be efficient. Not everything is about technology. So often we get briefs that are, that are really about figuring out how you tell a brand story. So Zagat, which is a product of Google, um, we got a brief from about a year and a half ago, which was at this point in life, Zagat is not the disruptor it used to be, and now there's Yelp, and there's others. And, and the point was, make Zagat relevant to millennials. How do you let people care about Zagat? And the first thing we do is look at Zagat really honestly from the marketing side of our company and say, you know, what makes Zagat actually valuable? And, and look at this critically. And what we said is, what Zagat does, if you're not familiar, is it takes a bunch of user-generated reviews, a bunch of stuff that people say online about a, a restaurant, and they distill that down into a single review that's a quote of quotes, essentially a best of curated by an expert. It gives you a tiny but perfect review. Why that's a solution to a pain point is if you've ever read reviews of, of hotels on TripAdvisor, you go straight to the negative reviews, you try to find out if this person is actually an asshole, or maybe they're like you, or they just hate hotel staff, or whatever. You, try to, you have to figure out and distill down from the reviews meaningful value. What Zagat does is they create that for you about a restaurant. So we saw that as an opportunity. Then what we do is we look at cultural insights. We, we try to figure out what is the thing that we can tap into in culture that people already care about that we can tie this to. And we saw a tiny food movement that had started in Japan, which was awesome videos of people making tiny food with tiny cutlery that was super, super cute and precious and perfect. And we thought we can marry these together to talk about a story that's about tiny but perfect. Um, Bite-sized reviews, perfect, perfectly sized. And we used this to create, again, no technology, uh, a live event in New York. This was just an, a pop-up uh, cafe called the Zagat Tiny Cafe for three days in Astor Place. We partnered with local restaurants uh, that were popular that we exchanged no money with, like Los Tacos uh, and Jacques Torres, and we served tiny versions of their dishes on tiny handmade plates, uh, kiln-fired in Portland, Oregon, um, in tiny boxes ordered from tiny menus, and we created a gallery of other restaurants that we couldn't serve dishes from, like Magnolia Bakery, so you could take perfect pictures. We contextualize it all through uh, uh, a tiny um, this, uh, table where you could have life-size forks next to tiny food. So these were tiny burgers and tiny tacos. And, and in the marketing world, even though this, this is somewhat irrelevant um, when you think about the numbers and terminology, this project had what's called a, a, you know, a billion earned media impressions. Potentially a billion people saw it. It was in the New York Times. It was on television news. And extremely successful for Zagat, and, and won a best of millennial campaign. So we did exactly what they, they needed to do. Um, we also do things that are a little bit more tech focused. We go the other direction. So this is technology we built from scratch that's in the uh, 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 Chelsea location of Google. So if you walk into their lobby, you'll see a wall of about 6,000 buttons. And this was based on the insight that the Google Creative Lab out of New York had that the most photographed uh, piece of the lobby area in Google was this kind of abstract Rauschenberg-esque uh, logo thing 
um, but it didn't really display the, the brand or the identity of Google. It didn't say anything about Google other than the word Google. So we wanted to figure out, is there something that we can do that's, that's more expressive of what Google actually is and what the brand is? And so this is a wall that's fully customizable. It uses 6,000 arcade-style buttons. These are these buttons here. Behind there are, are custom electronic panels. They're all modular, 12 by 12 panels um, that use LED light pipes, basically like little light pipes that go to the edge of the button. The button is the only thing that's off the shelf, and that was heavily modified. Uh, the, it acts like a low-resolution touchscreen, so you can push buttons on it, roll on it, you can build um, uh, interactions for it, it's interactive, you can display information on it, and then we built this all to run on the Chrome browser so that artists could build inter interfaces for this uh, the same way they would build for the Chrome browser. So it's an entire platform um, called AnyPixel, that all, it's about creating displays out of unusual objects, so it can be used to create displays uh, out of uh, toggle switches if you want. Um, on the flip side, we jump back to marketing. Uh, we helped to launch Google Retail in the UK uh, with a, an interactive doodle wall. This is a spray paint can um, that allows you to do digital graffiti on a wall and doodle over the Google logo, something that we think is unique to the Google brand. Um, so how could we create a physical kind of hardware expression uh, when Google didn't have a lot of hardware at the time? Um, this is a, a you know, fully developed uh, in-house at Deep Local. This is industrial design spray can um, with, you know, with aluminum components. It has emi em IR emitters on each can. They're, they're wireless uh, communication and wireless charging. Um, they are uh, they are tracked overhead with motion tracking cameras, typically used in film capture. We, we use those in kind of an abstract way so that you can draw in real time. We can measure your velocity angle, all that sort of stuff. It's a product we invented for Google. And then we tooled up a factory to mass produce those to support installations uh, in different parts of the world. Um, so that's a, an in instance of really inventing um, true technology for, on behalf of a client. I'm only showing you those brief things about what we do because here's what matters, right? Oftentimes we are doing something that's never been done before every time a client gives us a brief. Sometimes we're developing IP, we hold patents ourselves, sometimes we're developing patented technology for our clients, sometimes patentable technology doesn't matter. But innovation, making stuff that's never been done before, most businesses will tell you that that is the worst business model ever. Um, I, I've been told that over the years, for the last 11 years of my company, on and off. Now I'm up for CEO of the year in Pittsburgh with Luis Von on, but it's funny because the same people who are on that committee told me I had no business plan 11 years ago, which is so funny because I do not know how to run a business. I just know how to make stuff and, collect, and get people together that are smarter than me and kind of, uh, kind of nudge them along to solve problems collectively. So, but our business model is never about doing the same thing twice. Um, it's always about trying to find a solution that, that hasn't been found by someone else. So we'll use pieces of other things that we've invented, but what happens by doing that is that you create an environment where people are constantly learning, developing new ways to solve problems. You, you get the very best staff attracted to that business because those are the people that want to solve problems that don't want the three-year product development cycle. So creating that environment as a service company um, is critical because all that really matters, all I'm really selling, are the people that work with me every day. So anyhow, it's not easy to do this stuff because you're, you're always entering into uncharted territory. It's never a version of something I've done before. It's more art than science because our, our work is subjective. And for engineers, that's extremely challenging. There's a subjective uh, you know, you know, goal that we have in mind. It's difficult to staff for. Um, you know, because we have to have people that are flexible enough and inventive enough that they want to solve problems that are outside of the discipline they may have studied in school. And it has the perception of being risky. And that's something that, uh, you know, I really want to kind of address in here, what risk actually means. So we have some core principles, I think, drive the, the whole culture of the company, and that's, you know, efficiency. You know, get stuff done fast. We, we don't have a model, an option for that. I used to use this term gutter tech. It's an old cyberpunk term. It means using the lowest common denominator technology to solve the problem. We only got what we got. We got to get something done, figure it out. The, the story I always tell about that is our VP of technology, who is a former aerospace engineer for the military. When he joined Deep Local, he walked into a shop that was filled with Ryobi parts, like tools. Uh, if you know tools, Ryobi. I don't work for them, but uh, not the best. Um, so we, uh, you know, he's evolved into now we have a you know, 7,000 square foot shop, but, but he never once told me we didn't have the equipment he needed to get the job done. He found a way to get it done, and then we built the company up uh, to be able to do more work. Autonomy, you have to allow people to make decisions on their own, and you have to trust them to do that. As long as you have open communication, you can be there to help them out along the way. And diversity, diversity and discipline. We have a lot of different disciplines at the company, and they have to be able to work well with each other without 
egos. Designers can't think they're better than engineers. Engineers can't think they're better than marketers or strategists. You all have to understand that we have a problem. We're attacking it just like a startup. We need to get to the end, and we all have value to add, and that's, that's critical. You have to have respect for the people working next to you. I'm running out of time. So efficiency, what does it mean? We build shit ourselves. Um, we think this is critical. Um, we combine a studio, a shop, and a warehouse. All that stuff is in one. Our engineers are creatives. They are involved in that creative process. No one has one say over someone else. And we're constantly improving on the ability that we have, the stuff we're able to make, constantly adding to that kind of arsenal. Autonomy, um, you know, basically project teams uh, have, have the room to kind of roam on their own. Once they have a game plan, a timeline, and a deadline, they know how to get there. They need to step up and support one another. Uh, team members are considered equals. And diversity, when I talk about those teams, there needs to be mutual respect between disciplines. Very few people do exactly what they went to school for. Um, all team members are able to contribute to creative. I have a picture here from Scum Cohen Sons, two-time dropout from CMU, Nick Teodori. He's a freelance creative with us from time to time. We try to get people from the outside and involve the community in Pittsburgh and experts in areas that we are not experts in as much as we can. Madeline, who spoke earlier, uh, we've worked with on projects, for example. So what about risk? Going through this really fast, this is what people actually care about, failure and lawsuits. They often think that we're doing things that are going to be high risk uh, or uh, attract a lawsuit. We've never been sued, um, and we don't think we actually have the risk that people perceive. Um, we involve uh, engineers in the entire process, uh, vetting ideas, building things out. We prototype everything. Uh, a wide range of domain experts allows us to solve problems as they arise, and we use a larger local engineering community to solve specialized problems. Lawsuits don't matter to us because we perform preliminary patent searches on anything that we're inventing that is new. We've gotten very familiar with our lawyers. We're friendly with them. If we have patentable technology, we'll go there. If, we're in vi if we think we are at risk of violating a claim and a patent, we steer clear of it. Um, so we talk regularly to our lawyers and our clients' lawyers. And then ultimately, the only thing that really matters at a service company, whatever you do, advertising design or the people that you have there, not the brand or the company logo or the history or any of that stuff. The people you have are doing the work. And the only thing, my core number one job is to keep the best staff I possibly can uh, at that company. And they come from a variety of backgrounds. Everything you see here from architecture, computer science, fine art, psychology, industrial design, information systems. It doesn't matter where they come from. They have to have kind of the, the mentality, the goal to do, uh, you know, the ability to do subjective work, the uh, desire to solve problems and the ability to, to work fast and efficiently. And then my last kind of caveat, what attracts people to Deep Local? Why would they come work for the, any of this? So unlike product R&D labs, um, our staff are challenged with a variety of problems every step of the way. The, the benefit, you can think what you want about advertising. Here's the nice thing. My problem for the next two weeks will be a different problem than three weeks from now. It's, it's fun and rewarding to have different challenges in different domains as we grow and change our company. Um, problem solvers need variety. Um, they grow stale. Amateurs and, and people with a wide range of backgrounds and experiences, we can draw from all those. So we have a unique kind of makeup and culture that allows us to do that. Uh, and then making things real and physical is rewarding. I get bored sitting behind a desk. I step down, I get to touch something in the real world, I feel a little bit better, that's very Marxist, but I think it's important for everyone to get out from behind their desk on a regular basis and dig a hole or make something, go do some carpentry, and then you do physical labor here. That's all I have. Cool, thanks. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. And here we thought designers and engineers couldn't get along. All right, I'm a little, I'm, a, I'm excited but a little wistful to introduce our final speaker of the evening. So I hope you all come in and join us. Mimi Onuaha is an artist and a researcher examining the implications of data collection and computational categorization. Her work uses code, writing, and sculpture to explore missing data and the ways in which people are abstracted, represented, and classified. Please join me in welcoming Mimi to the stage. Hi, everyone. Just really quickly, thank you to all the people at Google Design for putting this on. This has been great. Uh, thanks, Golan Levin, for your help with some slides. And thank you to all of you who are inexplicably here at 5 o'clock on a Friday for the final talk. Thank you. In honor of you being here and in honor of your time, I'm just going to jump right in. So my name is Mimi. 
uh, as my bio said, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about data collection, but specifically about the implications uh, of data collection and my ongoing attempts to make sense of these implications of this world that we live in, in which more data is being collected than ever before for more reasons and outputs than ever before and in more ways than ever before. And all of you kind of know about this because we've been talking about it for the past two days, you know, dropping words like uh, big data and sometimes census data or biometrics or AI or machine learning or maybe you do data viz or maybe you do data analysis. You, you know all the terms. You know all that. So I'm not going to start by talking about that. Instead, I want to talk about this, this like, little corner of the data collection landscape that I really like that I call weird data. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's like weird, I'm talking about weird data sets, things that you wouldn't normally think about when you think about data. So for example, over at Quartz, which is a place I sometimes work for, um, we have this chart of America's most prolific wall punchers. This is like people who get angry and then they punch a wall, then they have to go to the ER. And thank goodness, we have the data set for it. Uh, they also did this really nice, this really nice chart. You will be unsurprised to discover that wall punchers, like the highest, <laughs> 15, 16, and 17 are the ages with the highest number of wall punchers, but you probably will be surprised to see that at 69, we still had a wall puncher. <laughs> Don't know. Uh, less, this is slightly more PG-13, but we have dildology.org, which has the motto, in dildo veritas. Um, this is, so anyway, this is, this is another data set, another weird data set. It's a public database around pleasure products or sex toys. As you can see, they take donations, so you can support your local weird data. A really good one, I really like this one, the National Public Toilet Ma Map. Any Australians? Anyone? No? Yeah? Yeah, okay, cool. Well, thank your government for this. This, is, this comes from y'all. This is actually, I think it's really great. So the Australian Department of Social Services, um, they keep this, uh, this map of over 17,000 public and private toilets. And they include all this information about location, uh, if it has like baby changing things, how like open it is to people with disabilities. Sounds really great, and that's something that the government is doing, but not to be outdone. We have our own version of this in America. Of course, in typical American fashion, it's not run by the government. Instead, it's run by a private corporation, Charmin, which you may be familiar with, of toilet paper fame. Uh, this is called Sit or Squat. You can download it right now. It tells you all the, the cleanest public toilets near you. And apparently, as you can see, the reviews are in, and it's indispensable. I can't tell if that's a pun or not. It could be, I don't know. And then this wouldn't be a talk about weird things on the internet if we didn't include cats. So this is the cat data set. Uh, really useful if you want to do any machine learning image stuff. You've got this data set of 10,000 cat images. The thing that I like the most about this is that as they say, they say we annotate the head of a cat with nine points, two for the eyes, one for the mouth, six for the ears. And then they have this image of kind of what that, what that looks like which is this, <laughs> and I just, once you've seen a cat's face diagrammed like this, you will never unsee it. Every cat you ever look at, you're gonna see this, I promise you. I know, because I've looked at it for a long time. Okay, so I know to a crowd like this, I don't really have to define what data is because you know, but I have a definition of data that I really, really like, and so I do wanna share it with you. It comes from Mitchell Whitelaw, this Australian academic, and he says, data are measurements extracted from the flux of the real. I really like this. I think there's something quite poetic about it. But the thing I think is really clever is in this word extracted, which kind of gets it like oil and resources, and I think actually connects us to some other topics in the wider landscape of data collection. It reminds me of Shoshana Zuboff's idea of surveillance capitalism, which she says is this form of a capitalism that we've ascended into now, in which companies um, monetize data, which they've gathered through perfunctory surveillance. And so Mitchell Whitelaw's definition, I think, is really good because it kind of starts to get at that idea, like I said, this, this wider landscape of data collection. But the thing is, when I think about these weird data sets, like this one, my absolute favorite, which is UFO sightings, UFO reports, uh, it's got 80,000 and more uh, from the past century. The thing I like the most about this data set is that this is like somebody who's trying to do a cleaned up version of it, and they say that it's the most, uh, what is it, the most challenging, oh, the most badly formatted data I personally have ever seen, considered by some to be obfuscated on purpose, which makes sense, because why would aliens want, to, like, want us to be tracking them and have that data available? Of course, it's obfuscated on purpose. 
But when I think about weird data sets like this, it sometimes it's hard for me to see that intuitive, organic connection to, to white law's definition. And so I have my own definition of data that I use too. And that is this, which are data are the things that we measure and care about. And sometimes the things we care about enough to measure. And if white law's definition sort of suggests a world of pure source, like a heap of raw material, data being that raw material that's just waiting to be cut up and structured into neat cells and Excel spreadsheets, then my definition sort of highlights a different thing, which is maybe, maybe in some case the opposite, the fact that all data sets are actually created by people who have a stake in their existence. So, like I said, I want to talk to you about data collection. As you can probably tell, I spend a lot of time thinking about data collection. Even these definitions and everything I'm telling you today actually comes from years of work and sort of research that I've been doing with this. And that's because, uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm an artist and a researcher, and so I make sense of the world through doing research but, and through thinking and writing, but I also like to do art projects and pieces that help me kind of get at whatever body of inquiry I'm really into in any, in any particular time. So for instance, this is a project I did. It's called We Are Searching For. I did this while I was a visiting researcher at the Royal College of Art. Uh, I wrote a script, put it on the public computers, and then used that. In the script, what it did was it scraped uh, the browser search queries from the public computers. So I took all those and then aggregated them into this one print and then showed it at this show at the RCA. So it kind of was this thing about taking these strange artifacts of a community that I was only able to get because I was a member of the community and then reflecting it back to that community. Another piece that I did while I was in London uh, is this project. It's called Pathways. Somehow, I managed to convince four groups of Londoners to give me a month's worth of their mobile data. And we sort of were acting out this relationship that already exists. We were like, playing out this microcosmic version of this relationship by which people have their own uh, devices and companies are constantly gathering data so that I was that person, except that they could see me and tangibly see what I was doing with the data and kind of think about what that experience was like. For part of that project, I made this website, sort of a data, data storytelling website, made it for National Geographic, and on it I included all this stuff, including these maps for the different groups, which on the actual website animate over time. Uh, and for some of them, I gathered this information about their message metadata. So when they were communicating with each other, through which medium, media, uh, and how often they were doing it. I also have done some performances. This is a performance I did. Uh, it was called Pulse. It was site-specific. It only happened one time. There was no documentation of it. Um, and what I did was I had this heart, um, Pulse like heartbeat monitor. And so I was collecting my own heartbeat data, but I was projecting it around the room. And it was this room full of 300 people. And so whenever people interacted with me, they could actually see my pulse and how I was <laughs> responding to our interactions. And it was meant to get at this idea of, OK, we can collect a lot of things, but how much do you really want to know? Like, when is that, when are you crossing that line? When is it too much? In the end, this sort of ended up backfiring on me because after, when I got set up for this, after I'd put on the heart rate monitor, I got this text message from someone I was dating, essentially dumping me. And I, I know, like, heart on your sleeve, heart on your wall, it was bad. Uh, but then, so then my friends would come and then they would ask me how I was doing and of course I was like, I don't even remember that person, like, I don't care. And they would just look at my, like, heart rate and they'd be like, you do care, we all know. <laughs> And then the most recent piece that I've done is this. It's called Us Aggregated, and it actually um, takes Google's image uh, algorithms as its source. And what it's meant to do is kind of talk about the ways in which this sort of poetry of the archive, but also the ways in which we are rendered uh, using reverse image search and the similarities that we have, but also the role that companies like Google play in sorting us and in being the invisible hand that gets to shape that and what that means. So all of these projects and more are sort of my way of answering this question of who has a stake in a data set. And it's also my way of getting at the subjective experience of being people, whether it's me or my colleagues or strangers, who are being rendered collectible. But there's a flip side to all of this, and I think it is actually best explained and articulated in this uh, very good but very, very dry. I want to recommend it. But I don't know, it's very, like I said, it's very dry. You should read it, but just, you'll just have to struggle through it. Uh, this book called Sorting Things Out, Classification and Its Consequences. 
This is by Jeffrey Boker and Susan Lee Starr. It's a really good book, and it talks about this idea that we make sense of the world through classification systems. And one example that they use in the book uh, is traffic lights. And so they talk about how these traffic lights, they're divided into the red and the yellow and the green, and these sort of arbitrary distinctions we actually put a lot of meaning into. So they classify the world, and they completely direct our action. But the more incisive and more insightful point that they make later on in the book is that actually classification systems don't organize reality equally for everyone. And so, uh, for example, the traffic lights, they're great if you can see, but if you're blind, then obviously they're not able to organize your reality. I like this because I think data sets are sort of the outputs of these intentional orderings of classification systems. And in the same way that the traffic light it shows us exactly what we prioritize, which is vision, and then what gets, what gets uh, excluded from that, I think data sets point to their own contrast. So their very existence highlights the things that we haven't collected. And to me, that suggests that there might be a special type of importance to be found in looking at the things that we leave out. So uh, here are some things, some, some data that we don't collect number of US citizens illegally detained in detention centers, number of people in New York and in other cities living off lease in uh, illegal housing situations, and unsafe housing situations, I should add, local and state police departments using stingray tracking devices to be able to better track the mobile communications of residents and citizens. How much American currency is outside of the United States at any given time? I call these missing data sets. There are these blank spots in spaces that are otherwise data saturated. And to me, they form this sort of ghostly parallel to the weird data sets that I was talking about earlier, because these also are vertices of measurements. They're also things, uh, things that, points of collection, except they're the things that we don't collect. So the things that we don't think about, the things that we don't really talk about. Uh, this is the GitHub repo where I've included, uh, where I do a lot of research, where I've included a lot of my thoughts on this. Um, and I've sort of made myself a shepherd over these missing data sets in kind of interesting ways. And in doing so, I've learned a lot from them. So, for instance, people who want to collect it actually can't do it because they don't have access to it or they don't have data, uh, they don't have resources. Then on the other hand, people who have the resources and access have no incentive to be able to collect this. And I'll give you a good example of this in a bit. I've also, in many instances, found myself working with groups who have missing, who, who are missing data and want to fill it. As in this example, when I worked with this group of Broadway actors, I don't know if any of you know this, uh, but for a long time, there has been no data on the race or ethnicities of performers on Broadway stages. Or there wasn't until this group kind of came along and spent five years doing the hard work to collect that. And I worked with them, and we managed to put it together and write it up. And in fact, this group I worked with was, was this group of Asian American performers, and they did uh, discover that they were being vastly underrepresented. And it was something that they hadn't been able to make a case about before because every time they tried to bring it up, they were told, that's not true, you can't prove that. Now they have the data for it. Uh, this, this project, I showed you the GitHub repo where it lives there, and you see that I also work with groups who are missing data, but it also lives in other forms. And one of those forms is an art piece, which is called the Library of Missing Data Sets. If you just look at this, it looks like an ordinary filing cabinet, uh, but you can actually open it, and when you open it, you'll see that there are all these folders inside of it, and they each are labeled with the title of a missing data set. If you open the folders, you'll discover that they're empty, there's nothing in them, the content is missing, just like the data. And 
just want to make sure that I get this point across. I don't mean to suggest that I think that we need to be collecting everything that's missing. That's not really the point of the project. Uh, there's, there's a tension in it there, in that, and there are loads of people who have done just fantastic work, people like Helen Nissenbaum, Helen Nissenbaum and Finn Brunton, who have talked about obfuscation. And even in my work, in talking with people in New York, such as undocumented people who are working in the restaurant business, we've discovered that often there are a lot of benefits to non-existence. For people who are situationally disadvantaged, it can be really, really powerful to not be represented. And there's another tension within the project as well. When I first used to talk about missing data sets, I used to always use the same example because it resonated really well with an American audience, which is that for a long time, we used to never collect data on civilians killed by the police. This despite the fact that we have loads of data about incarceration, about policing, and about justice in general. So this was a missing data set. But now, thanks to the really hard and just painstaking work of a bunch of individuals and a lot of groups, we actually have this data. So it's not missing anymore. However, it's great, it is great. Uh, but people, and overwhelmingly black, unarmed people, are still being killed by the police, even now. Which is just to say that we can't confuse data collection with substantive uh, social change in that in challenging this oppression and challenging injustice, we have to remember that the collection is still just a starting place. Even still, I think there's something really powerful about this. Um, the next thing I'm working on is trying to make a website for this because uh, I want to put all these data sets online and I also want other people to be able to contribute to it. I don't want to be the lone shepherd of this and I think that there's power in the more, more and more of these that we add and I want other people to be contributing their own. And I think that these, these missing data sets, they do a lot of really interesting work. And one thing that they show us is that, in fact, there are patterns of exclusion the more time I spend working with them, the more I see that it's, exclusion is something that must be had because, of course, we have to classify the world, but actually that burden of exclusion is not equally shared at all. And there are certain groups, and like I said, certain reasons for why certain groups constantly see that certain things are missing. But I actually have hope because I, and I think that the missing data set thing what it allows us to do is sort of complicate this. And it pushes at this idea that data collection is this very simple and obvious and easy thing, which I know that all of us can fall into the habit of thinking. But if we remember that data sets are created by those with a stake in the data, then that means that all we have to do is think about what data we want to have a stake in. So we don't live in a world right now where we collect certain information. We don't collect information about who prisoners might vote for, if they could, or if they had the right to vote for president. But then what kind of world would it be like if we did live in that? So then the missing data sets, they, sh they always point to this idea that we can be, if the world is being rendered collectible, we are the ones who are making it collectible. And so we can change it and render it differently every single time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mimi. And thank you to all of our attendees. Thank you for coming to SPAN. Thank you for making it wonderful for your enthusiasm, your engagement today and yesterday. It's been our pleasure to host you. Um, and, and we're just so impressed by the collective talent here in Pittsburgh. You should all be feeling incredibly proud of your city. Um, we've been really impressed, and yeah, so thank you to our speakers and panelists for your tireless work. And thank you to the SPAN team. I want to just give a shout out to all of the people that made this happen, um, part particularly our designers, Damian Carell, Shannon Correa, Paul Schlachter, Anthony Zakowski, our writers and strategists, Barbara Eldridge, Bryn Smith, our amazing producers, Corinne Onetta, Haley Peak and our intern, Jonathan Zong, and Liam, who's doing podcasts for the Material Design Awards, and thank you to Optimist for helping us bring this event together from the ground up, literally. Studio Gorm, who helped us envision the space and also hosted an amazing workshop today. And thank you to all of our, our friends and teammates from the Material Design team at Google who helped us make this programming possible and who support our mission actually with what we're trying to do with SPAN. Thank you so much. Um, again, please share all of your pic pictures, your observations with us. We really love to hear from you and hear about what you liked. 
Um, and we'll also be sending a short survey to everyone who came just to kind of get feedback. Please let us know what you think, the good, the bad, the bathrooms on the fifth floor. <laughs> seriously, we take your input really, really seriously. So, so please let us know. And for everyone here, we have these pins. Go out, enjoy your beautiful city, um, get some culture, and um, thanks again. <laughs>